sorry. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the FinTech OI. I am Sumit Gilitwala, manager and lead FinTech initiatives at Startup Risco. Before we begin, a big thank you to all the frontline workers, doctors, volunteers, and everyone working endlessly across the country during this pandemic. Our heart goes out to all the friends and family who have lost their near and dear ones in these tough times. We are in this together and only way out of this is by uh, getting everyone vaccinated. So register yourself and get vaccinated at the earliest. With that being said, I would like to take this opportunity and kickstart with today's program. Built on the founding pillars of Startup First, Startup Riso is a network of startups, enterprise, capital, markets, and services. Bringing in a structured interface, for enabling unique linkages. As a company, our work revolves around technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Over the years, FinTech has been a major part of our work, with our founders uh, built several FinTech accelerator programs and FinTegrate, which many, one, many of you must have attended in the past. Well, we live in this world where cat images are sold for $600,000 and Redditors uh, give hedge fund a run for their money. But not everything is just storms. Once we ignore the noise and focus on the right direction, uh, we get towards some interesting inferences. Today, is, India is one of the largest fintech market with the highest fintech adoption rate of 87% across the globe. India attracted $2.7 billion in fintech investments in 2020 alone, with a total of 12 new unicorns added in the past four months in 2021 in India. Three of them were fintechs. India has the uh, world's second biggest fintech hub with uh, over 2,500 startups operating, uh, which is up from 737 in 2014. This alone uh, gives the potential of the segment. Uh, with building India's largest fintech focused conference, Fintigrate, we learned that to foster innovation, it is important for the industry to come together under one roof. With that vision, we are building Fintech OI as an open innovation community platform. We aim to create a resource of startups, banks, incumbents, investors, consultants, researchers, and ecosystem enablers. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to the first speaker for the evening, Mr. Naveen Surya. Naveen is a chairman at FinTech Convergence Council. Naveen has been known for the revolutionizing electronic payment solutions in India. Backed with uh, 17 plus years of experience in the finance industry, he introduced India's first ever multi-purpose cash cards he has worn multiple hats across the industry and has been a fintech leader, investor, mentor, and a founder contributing to the growth of payments and financial service industry in India. I will hand over the mic to our CEO, Mr. Ajay Ramasubramaniam, who will moderate the session on digital transformation, a journey through collaboration and open innovation. Over to you, Ajay. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sumit, for uh, kicking off proceedings uh, and also uh, passing on a word of uh, caution, precaution, whatever you call it around the, the situation that we are all surrounded by. Uh, thank you for the safety message and uh, always a pleasure to have this conversation with uh, Naveen, who definitely does not require too much of uh, introduction in the in the fintech space. But uh, coming to the, the topic itself of digital transformation, journey through collaboration and open innovation, it was originally supposed to be a keynote and thanks to Naveen for making this more of an interactive uh, conversation. Uh, but Naveen, before we dive into some of the, the questions and having a conversation around the topic, I'd like you to kind of uh, make some remarks and, and then dive into it. So over to you. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, first of all, many congratulations to you, Sweta and your team. I think I've always seen uh, pioneering work that you've done in FinTech. I was always focused on payments, but I think uh, FinTech, I followed your lead and then expanded my scope of uh, industry work to FinTech. Uh, amazing work that you've done for ecosystem. It has been always my pleasure to support you in whatever you do. So congratulations to you, Swita, and the entire OIT. Very interesting initiative. Uh, well, I would say that uh, it's an interesting time for a topic and it's an interactive interesting time to reflect since we also have quite a bit of a time sitting at home. Uh, every few years now, I think not decades now as things are moving, we have to think about how the way that we conduct and the way we work, whether in our personal lives, whether in our uh, business lives, whether in our thought processes. And uh, 
open innovation is one of those topics whose time has come. I mean, there are biggest transformation that has happened. It has happened whether it's start of internet, whether it's start of crypto, whether it's start of uh, blockchain, without community work of experts to clients, to all the stakeholders coming together, it wouldn't have been there where it is. Uh, obviously, as most of us as an organization, as an entrepreneurs, as a kind of business leads, managers in our own roles, we always give confidentiality and some sort of, you know, hiding everything that we do a very high, let's say very high or a prime importance over a period of time. It gets into a habit, but it also creates silos. Gone are the time when you actually work in the silos. I think it's about time that the world really start conversing, work as one on most critical and important problems. And uh, financial services, penetration or underserved community is one of those problems. We really have to solve it genuinely, not just for India, but uh, across the globe. We actually need to use every resource, whether intellectual, whether companies or all kinds of stakeholders come together, put their brain together to it and then achieve that solution. I think it's a win-win. That's where I would stop. Uh, and as I said, I promised me to make it an interactive one, not a one-way process. Thank you. Thank you so much for setting the tone uh, on the on the topic and the conversation. So I'm picking on on three words from uh, what what you just spoke and the and the topic that we discussed. One is the the, the digital transformation aspect. The second one is that of uh, collaboration, and the third one, uh, whose time has come, uh, open innovation. So let me come with the the first one and. And rather than just uh, limiting the, the conversation to this digital transformation, let us talk about a more holistic kind of a, a business transformation. And while it is uh, uh, an in fashion kind of topic, not just for today, but for, for decades, I don't think that we can be in a better time than now to talk about it, where I think for a lot of us to kind of continuing to stay relevant to whoever our stakeholder is, is pretty important. And FinTech has been and is at the core of uh, India's digital economy. And while in the last 15 months, the, the world has been grappling with the, the pandemic and, and other situations that uh, have kind of erupted around it. In, in your words, how has uh, FinTech's own business model kind of undergone its transformation? And I'm talking from a standpoint of technology, uh, business models, and also the overarching policies. So before I come to, let's say, fintech transformation, whether digital or business, let me first focus on word business transformation. And actually, when first time you sent me this topic, I wasn't sure whether you were aware that I started my career as a management consultant. Uh, way back in 96, 97, part of uh, one of the largest IT's uh, management division, where it was also the year they were setting up a business transformation. First time. And I think those, those were the time, these were the early terms. And to be honest, the word transformation in a business context, I'd also heard for the first time that time. And uh, a lot of time we probably misuse that word, Ajay. The transformation, as we know in a simple terms, we use it very, let's say a generic term or a layman term, but the reality is that it's very, very different. As we all know, the transformation is something like when a moth turns to a butterfly or when a seed turns into a plant, which means it does not leave a trace of your originality. It becomes completely different. And yes, eventually you get those same origins back, either as a seed coming back onto the plant, et cetera, and butterfly again, giving birth to another moth. So that whole process continues, but the real transformations have not happened, whether I, I, I don't know whether I should call it fortunately or unfortunately across the corporate world. There are very, very few examples that one can give. The one couple of them that I remember from my early days were uh, one of those, we were always talking about something like IBM from a hardware company to completely a services company. So that complete that was always called as a complete transformation that a company that was and then what it has become. Similarly, the another example we used to give early days was about uh, G, which was again a large manufacturing hub, a very different kind of animal from there completely, one of the largest financial services company, right? So there are, there are a few more examples in other industries, but in financial services industry, we have not seen these transformational examples as much. You've seen it in a in a industries which have hard coded or a hardcore R&D kind of a situations where the technology is completely transformed. Uh, part of the reason also, Ajay, could be that most of these industries are not kind of allowed to reach a brink. You know, the examples we used to get early days for a business transformation need is 
you have to imagine a situation that you are in the middle of a sea on a wooden platform which is burning and before it burns you have to find a way out you have to survive so transformation happen when you have a life and death situation it does not happen otherwise it's for a monk it has to to be alive either it has to convert itself into a butterfly or it has to die so if you see financial services majority cases because they are regulated and fair fairly managed they're not usually get into a brink of that urgency where they need to change completely so what i call is that what you see in most cases is a business evolution less of a transformation and i think uh, human beings are well aware of uh, evolution we are all product of evolution but usually it's slower than transformation and it is a in a way okay it's a continuous progress i would call more of a evolution for fintech rather than transformation just to use that term slightly more appropriately while we all like to believe that we have transformed the reality is that i haven't seen that kind of a transformation in fintech happy to be corrected as we kind of go across the session or in future so if you talk about fintech business evolution whether through pandemic and uh, over a period of time how it has changed uh, if you look at in terms of technology i think a lot has changed completely changed whether it is for the fintech themselves or whether it's for other traditional players and if you see those changes the drastic ones are already visible on the customer acquiring processes customer servicing processes i think a video kyc two year when which was in infancy somehow it came in time and i'll talk about it more with a different examples is today a reality today whether you're a psu whether you're an insurance player whether you're a mutual fund uh, for a customer to register with a video or a digitally is a normal is a norm while you had only aadhar before that but this has become even for an entity which doesn't have access to aadhar has become like a mainstream and it's not just this i think chatbots ai engines i think the technologies which were getting explored to be kind of done in a future have accelerated the uses of those tools and kind of identifying whether as i said by traditional players or by the fintechs themselves to evolve faster and add to all those technology solutions which can remove the physical part or a paper part in the processes has got super accelerated so we've already seen that the numbers are great the experience is good thankfully because of that lot of entities could grow could continue that business now i think you also wanted to discuss about transformation or uh, as i call evolution in business model now i would say that is not as much a result of pandemic that's a continuous evolution that most entities have to do in fact most fintechs don't have on a day one in most cases when the entrepreneur started a startup a clear business model so it automatically evolves for them even in cases where it was i think uh, especially in a payment side our government and the policies have kept them on to to keep moving to find some newer ways so we all know what happened with the zero mdr so suddenly overnight a lot of companies had no business model from a traditional let's say business sense but suddenly obviously they have kind of geared up and identified areas so companies who were depending on just the money uh, p2p money transfers also talking about uh, let's say atm cash out or a, or a, let's say cash out through pos or cash out through upi kind of a tool and still earning on through it so evolution of that continues and the business models have been continuously evolving not just from transactions but from services but from features but from data i think and it will continue to grow and i guess that piece in a fintech is going to be an interesting and a continuous journey as we are still at early stage uh, i think you also were talking about uh, evolution in terms of policies now uh, interestingly i would say most during the pandemic time the policies have been more or less stable which is thankfully in fact there were a uh, lot more relaxations by the regulators to allow let's say having more time to adjust to the newer policies rather than having a newer one which actually in a way good sign because in that time for you to implement some of the newer changes other than what you've already done on a customer front side would have been difficult uh, at the same time i would say that there has been a lot of uh, generic term over last year the policy changes that have come otherwise have been remarkable i think the if you see the there if you look at the very macro level we have been advocating a particular thesis that how do you create a, a let's say a risk and a reward based value chain kind of a model for entities who get licensed so today over a period of time you see a very interesting regime for license or authorization where you can enter in let's say in a payment i'm using it as an example you could enter it as a ppi or a pa from there you could move it to be let's say a bbpou kind of a setup which is even bigger license or authorization from there you could move into payments bank 
from payment banks into small finance bank and then to a complete universal bank. If you just step back and go three or four years back, this kind of a thought process wasn't visible. While it was, while these rails were being laid down, but today there is a very clear evolved, let's say, growth for business. It is growth and our evolution in all terms, in terms of your business growth, in terms of your capability growth, in terms of your value creation growth. So this kind of a model that has come in from a policy government thought process is quite remarkable. And this has happened step by step. So people have not realized. That's why I wanted to bring it that example. And there's an increasing thought that how do you reward people who continue to do well, manage the risk well to go up? Those who are not doing well probably will get stuck or will be probably even downgraded to a lower license or a lower authorization. So that's the thought process which is coming in at the macro level. Obviously, there are many other interesting uh, aspects finally getting uh, attention like CBDC, uh, central bank issued digital currencies. Uh, there are thought process. I mean, some of it is already got implemented like video KYC. There is a SR. So many things happening across the fintech which are all positive on the whole. So I think the evolution continues and it's rapidly moving into a better space. That's where I will stop with the first one. Great. No, thank you so much. I also uh, totally agree and believe that uh, fintech is not a, a revolution, but it's kind of an uh, evolution, which is kind of happened over over a period of uh, decades. And I, I completely kind of uh, align with you on that. And that brings to me the to the second question. And I've just picked up uh, a quote, which I recently read in a, in a Forbes article on fintech, which states that collaboration is the new competition. And while the the the, the the quote by itself might seem to be uh, negative. It's not about that, but it's about how having a collaborative approach uh, lends itself well to whether it's established banks or financial service companies from a relevance perspective, where the, the fintech and the fintech related innovation kind of provides uh, impetus to the, to the incumbents. And on the other hand, the fintechs who are innovative, they're agile, they get to enjoy the, the decades of trust customer loyalty and, and security that, that users have. So if you were to bring it to the uh, Indian context, and if you were to look at larger initiatives, like whether it is uh, Sahemati or OSIN or the, the new umbrella entity, uh, all of which uh, are, are pretty much very relevant and are all kind of uh, probably centered around how it can be a more collaborative ecosystem. As a key stakeholder of, of, uh, of NUE and, and some of the other things that you've been seeing and championing at uh, PCI, and FCC, uh, can you can you throw some light on this phrase? Collaboration is a new competition. So I think the collaboration has come into the center light after two decades in India, or rather, let's say for the last five plus years, so decade and a half. I see more as a function of again evolution of the industry itself. If you look at the overall fintech industry, I divide it now in three generations. Generation one, which I think I was part and I already feel like parent in there. <laughs> like, let's say, which was like people like us, Policy Bazaar, uh, Bill Desk. You know, some of us had put in uh, identity to FinTech. Before that, there was no concept of a non-bank entity getting recognized as a key player in a financial services space. Yeah, you had some FinServs uh, in NBFC space, very large entities, but they were not tech-driven. They were slightly different animal. All of them have done a lot of work. So our job was to not just identify a unique niche services which are kind of not being catered to by the existing system, but also get, let's say, regulator and a government's confidence and to say that, hey, these are the people, they could do the same job and they can be trusted. So we had to lay that foundation. From here, if you see the next generation that came in, they use this foundation and say, hey, guys, while you identified and gave us the base, the reality is that with our mindset, we could grow a lot faster and they they became the challenges. So we all know what happened. There was a time when Vijay, the way he drove ATM, it also became for, for a brief period of time, a tug of war between banking and non-banking players that, that we are the challenges, we can do a better job. But then again, if you see within a short span of a time, it shifted with the collaborators coming in. And then we saw suddenly a newer models where let's say someone like Samir, a, a phone pay, uh, starts working with some smarter banks we also realize that how do we get collaboration in place where we get best of the both world. Banks bring in what they have, which is the license, trust, confidence, customers. Fintechs bring the agility, brings the new cutting edge technologies. So what I call is a, is a hybrid kind of a model. And this hybrid model actually brings in a best of the both world. So we're at a stage where I call that we are trying to kind of live within that hybrid world where we are working together. And again, collaboration, somewhere is still more like two entities coming together. 
sometimes it's also like a marriage right you have to start trusting each other it's not like a open collaboration where a lot of people are coming together now from here we need to kind of move in a direction where multiple entities are coming together which is where like you said that there is a model like pci fcc which again we have laid down where industry have come together for certain cause certain issues certain friction and learning also has been that people usually come together not because there is a larger opportunity people come together because they have a common pain or they have a common problem to solve and this has been you know this is like a conflict management that you have no conflict when there is a crisis it's is that kind of a issue that sometimes negativity breeds the unity and sometimes a larger collaboration requires bigger problems so as the as the ecosystem gets complex as the problems become severe people come together and then they realize that ultimately our objectives and goals are same and they started working together so we've seen it in already the spaces of let's say policy side we've seen it you know in areas of business growing we've seen in some common areas where there are common pain from here we need to kind of mutate and reach a stage where it could be done in a mass scale like you said that nue is a kind of concept which is building the ecosystem we've done one experiment with npci where a lot of collaboration has happened with banks coming together even though compete they've already shown the success because of that right and now that is what is encouraging that can government do more and us more such players can come in parallelly encouraging more and more such model if you see on the other hand india is also developing a model where uh, in our uh, international open centers like gift cities etc they've also experimenting that can diverse set of industry players be regulated by one so we have now ifsca which is a integrated regulator at least across these zones and they are allowing different industry players to come together under one single license so suddenly the environment again is getting created where from just being a collaboration which is usually between specific entities or one or two entities it becomes a lot more involved by multiple entities coming together and that's a ecosystem which is getting framed so i would say it's like a competition which is true but it is only when it is true the moment it becomes lot bigger then it is like network effect then it doesn't matter because ultimately everyone is playing to its strength not necessarily weakness and actually drawing uh, or let's say covering their weaknesses with other strength so it actually becomes a win win for everyone yeah no uh, completely completely agree on agree on those points and i guess yeah i mean like uh, i mean question number 1 or your answer to question number 1 kind of led into this how the the evolution is what has kind of led to people to kind of think rethink and Yeah. Uh, unite uh, to solve a problem rather than uh, find differences and compete on thankfully yeah. we could create good success stories with the collaborative model which is actually yeah. encouraging everyone to experiment even bigger yeah and i think even the incumbents i mean for a, for a long time while uh, there were differences and it was more like fintechs need us more than the other way around i think uh, that's all a part of the the evolution right so I mean, phase 1 and 2 created the right seeds for a collaboration and i think having successful collaboration now we're yeah. ready to get into a bigger bigger level yeah. probably which is leading you into your open innovation it that it it lends itself into the the core of uh, this fintech oi as a platform which is open innovation i mean while we have been seeing talks around talks and some action for sure around sandboxes corporate accelerators corporate venture capital in in your view what is the the core of open innovation i mean it is often abused as a as a terminology i mean lot of things get called as open innovation and it is nothing more than probably marketing eyeballs but uh, what is the missing middle so to say and because and i'm not just talking from a standpoint of of you as a as a fintech entrepreneur but also the bigger roles that you've held at uh, pci and fcc from an ecosystem standpoint and the things that you see from a another side of the table as well i mean even for a forum like fintech oi or bringing together stakeholders what are the things that can uh, actually encourage this entire open innovation bit and be meaningful to the stakeholders so i could only narrate one real life example which actually became a uh, unplanned succession sorry success for open innovation we did it for different reason uh, if you get back behind the history of fcc which is about 2 years back uh, we did it largely to identify issues related to digitization across financial services and bring those together and one of the core issue when we started 3 years back was access of uh, uh, aadhar access missing because of the supreme court judgment and the whole industry knew that we the processes are getting digital we need a digital solution and obviously video is becoming more mainstream so the discussion was that can we create a common experience for a customer around video kyc 
or a digital KYC or a DKYC, can we have multiple such option? And uh, it the initiative started as probably more of a problem solving across the industry. And uh, interestingly, a lot of players were already experimenting individually, whether as a bank, whether as a whether as a as a telco, whether as a fintech. All of them came together, and uh, of course, Dilip Bay from NPCI was leading that uh, as a as a chair for the DKYC committee. Uh, done an amazing role there with a lot of people coming together. They, each of these players came together, whether they were supplier of solution, created a common standard, whether they were already kind of uh, doing a solution at a pilot stage in, in uh, bringing out the right uh, feedback in kind of helping us go to RBI and request for these guidelines. And to be honest, in a hindsight that happened kind of a six month before pandemic or a year before the pandemic. Imagine if that not being in a place where we would have been. So while today in a crisis, anyway, you need to come together and for, find a solution, but this became an example where it's an industry which realized that that's a core issue, we need to solve it. Can we all work together, though we all work even individually to get it done, but somewhere we all are aligned and then kind of contribute to make the right solution and get it approved from policymaker in some ways. So whenever we look at in India financial services, the real issue is penetration. And the real issue is that we're still working in silos. We are not able to leverage each other's strength and the customers is mostly not involved. The only way to solve a problem and again, other than banking, everything else, more than 60% kind of customers still needs to be solved for or served for. If that's the case, I think this is a perfect case, Ajay, for you to figure out how do you involve right from a customer to companies, multiple companies, dealing with that set of a customer, having products that could be relevant to that customer, and probably innovate. I also believe that there is a genuine reason that why insurance after so many years is 2%. It's not that you don't have enough players, you know, or for an example, credit dissemination is still 12% of GDP. Or let's say mutual fund or investment is still 2%. I don't think that it's a problem of customer readiness. I personally believe that the next 200 to 300 million customers are ready, but the products that we are offering, the way we are offering, the way we are approaching them is completely different. And that cannot get solved unless we genuinely put our mind behind and willing to open ourselves. So it's, lastly, I would just say, Ajay, that in this whole openness, the word openness is all about your own culture and about your own ethos. And because each one of us have been taught to keep things, this is confidential paper, this is confidential email, we need to break that cycle and say, hey, these opportunities are so big. We need to think of a larger goal and create a larger system which everybody can benefit with a certain rules to be played. So I think you are in a perfect timing and this is well-deserved. Another solution for the industry uh, from PCI FCC will provide you all the support required to make it successful and even take your help in certain areas. I want to stop there from the time perspective, but uh, this is all I would say for now. And uh, I think this is what is required for our industry now. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for touching upon some of the things probably that are getting missed out in the in the bigger scheme of things, but how it can, how probably changing the approach uh, and bringing customer into picture, you can continue to stay more relevant. I guess uh, one thing that we have all figured out or at least figured out in the last uh, few quarters is about continuing to stay relevant. So it is not about the strongest who survives, but or the fittest to survive, but one who continues to stay relevant is the one who, who survives. So Thank you, bringing the the customer angle into the into the play. Uh, Shweta and uh, and Sumit, should we take a couple of questions from the audience for for Naveen, if we have the time? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if we we can take a couple of uh, questions. So if anyone has one, you can do a raise of hand or just bring yourself on the screen and uh, you can you can have your question. We have time for a couple of questions. So please go ahead. Everyone has already got their questions answered by Naveen today and over the over the years. So I, I'm not seeing anyone come up with questions. So if that's the case, then, then thank you so much, Naveen. For, oh, hey, Nikhil has a question. Go for it, Nikhil. Uh, yeah. Hey, Naveen. Hi. Uh, and hi, Ajay. Uh, fantastic conversation, first of all. Uh, much more eye-lightening and very, very true and humble and new thoughts, I would say. Uh, I think just a small question uh, regarding the last point that you just made, which was very interesting that uh, 
uh when we say that the market is not ready i think you flipped the complete coin and said no no the market is ready maybe we are offering something uh, completely different and uh, that market of 200 300 million people which is not a small uh, thing nikhil if you can just introduce yourself as well so that there can be more context to the question we can't hear him i think we lost him oh Nikhil, if you're still there, uh, you can just introduce yourself. Not uh, Lavin can probably elaborate on on whatever question Nikhil just put out. I think we've lost him. Yeah. Anyone else? I guess else? we have a time for your next. Yeah. Person. Anyone else? Anyone else for a question? I think Brijesh has put a, a message on the chat window. Brijesh, uh, FCC is FinTech Convergence Council, so it's a industry uh, and stakeholder kind of body, and uh, PCI is uh, Payments Council of India. They both are are uh, I mean bodies that uh, Naveen heads as chairman emeritus, uh, and it is for the ecosystem. Both of them under are under IMAI. Karshinath, you have a question. Go for it. You can just introduce yourself uh, very briefly and then ask a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Karshinath Karadhan, managing director of Monadago. Uh, we are a blockchain solutions company. Uh, my question is related to like you know how India is addressing the payment needs of the bottom of the pyramid uh, because that is one segment like you know where uh, we completely miss out. Uh, one thing is because like you know the uh, prevalence or like you know the penetration of the smartphone is uh, more in the uh, urban areas more in the tier 1 tier 2 cities but there are many people like you know who still carry the feature phones so how do you address the payment needs of like you know those category who are at the bottom of the pyramid in fact very pertinent question uh, kasinath and this one question every rbi governor in it, most of their common addresses keep telling industry and this is what even the government keeps asking and if you see the initiative of nue this umbrella entity licenses one of the reason to open that up besides decentralization or de-risking is also exactly this that while we have lot many solution probably as many numbers or more than many developed countries but the penetration of digital payment is still about 150 million customer which means large number of customers are still not able to use it and exactly like you said especially people with uh, with just the feature phone and maybe the customers even without phone right let's not forget the areas where still you don't have telecom connectivity they are also the customers of money so this is precisely the point and this is where some of the policy work is happening this is where now the industry will have to respond by let's say either participating in that for which partly it has started also working with the ecosystem and designing solutions which can cater to their need so your question is absolutely right can i give you a time frame that by which it will be done absolutely difficult but we hope to do it in a decade decade and a half if you don't do some major intervention it may take even three decades that's where i can stop but i can say that your question is perfectly valid and this is quite a high important in most stakeholders including governments man uh nikhil you can go go ahead with your question this is the last question we'll take and then we'll i'll hand it over back to sumit Oh, yeah. Really sorry. Yeah. So uh, I think I was just saying that uh, when when we flipped the coin and said that the next hundred million and two hundred million are ready actually to consume the financial services, but it is I think a problem at a product side or a service end, where what can we offer them? I think that needs to be sorted. So Navin, uh, can you do you have any uh, like direction or do you in with your research or with your experience? I think. Uh, that where where this is lacking like is it is it for the next billion people where we are going below the credit card segment and all those or is it for a very different class like for example zeroda may be a good example where they actually penetrated into a existing class but made a very different product uh, which helped yeah so nikhil i think it was linked to what kasinath was saying that the problem of payments of a bottom or a middle pyramid is not just payments is a problem for insurance is problem for credit it's a problem for even investment or a wealth management and the quantum of let's say the value could be different for each of that segment but other than customers who don't have any money or let's say those who depend which are i think now less than 10 12% in the country which are let's say below the 
uh, below what we call is the poverty line. Everybody else who has money needs some solution within the financial services. The problem is most of the solutions in terms of ticket size, in terms of delivery processes, are tuned to top 10, top 10, top 10, 15 percent customers who have actually, while highly individualistic, but a lot more homogeneous behavior. They all understand English. They all have tech savvy. They all have, let's say, access to technology. They have money. So the choices are high. The issue here is that, let's say, if somebody want to invest even 100 bucks in Reliance, can they do it today? Wouldn't a remittance guy, can, can't, can't he afford 100 rupees a month? I think he can, but can he participate? Do we have a facility? Do we have a model where with the lowest cost we can do it? Can we have somebody paying, let's say, 10 rupees a month and kind of subscribe to insurance, which takes care of his basic need? So those kind of a problem, I think we all know this, but there can't be better time when technology is available to do some of it. We need some policy support. We need some newer model and some fresh thinking, how to do it in a smartest and a least cost or a most visible and sustainable way. So that's where I would stop broadly. But uh, I think what you're saying is exactly what I meant. Great. Thank you so much, Naveen, for, for taking time to address those questions and for the wonderful chat before. Uh, so, so thank you for your time. Uh, over to you, Sunil. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, thank you, Naveen. That was a great start to the to the session, and uh, thank you for bringing that conversation. Uh, I'm sure um, in the in the coming panel and fireside chat, you guys have set the bar much higher. So we will have to do uh, justice to it. So with that, I would now like to move on to the next session, which is um, a panel discussion focused on uh, fintech 2030. So here we would be talking about how the fintech uh, ecosystem in the next decade is going to look like. Um, though it's a broad topic, futuristic topic, but uh, I have great panel members here who are going to be doing justice to the topic and giving you information on what's going to happen or how the fintech ecosystem over the next 10 years is going to look like. Before that, we've seen a significant growth in the fintech sector over the past uh, uh, decade, right? And financial technologies has become embed uh, embedded in our lives. Um, and a number of cutting edge fintech startups that we see have done uh, a wonderful job in terms of changing the financial services landscape uh, in the country and uh, globally, in fact, not just in the country. And with pandemic, we've seen over the past 12 months, uh, the way things have moved rapidly. In fact, uh, changes which we were expecting to happen in fintech space over the past, uh, over the course of next five to seven years, uh, probably they all are happening today. And uh, with that, we would uh, like to now deeply uh, get into the conversation on understanding what's going to happen in uh, uh, next few years. So um, I'll now introduce our panel members here. So we have uh, with us Vivek Bilgavi, he's the partner at PwC. Uh, Melissa Frackman, she is the managing partner at EMBC. And Sudhir Pai, who is the chief technology and innovation officer at uh, Glo for uh, global financial services business at Capgemini. Um, so I'll request each of my panel members to give a very brief introduction uh, of themselves. Maybe we, we can start with you since I see you first on my screen. Uh, sure. Thanks, Peter. Happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, uh, Vivek Bilgavi, I've got a couple of roles in PwC. I look after the fintech and broader digital uh, technology that we do in financial services. I also drive alliances and ecosystems for the firm. Uh, and been closely working in this space uh, when Ajay and uh, you and team really came together for this. Uh, all your previous endeavors have been uh, uh, very unique and we have seen a genuine way by which you can work with the ecosystem. So happy to be here to support and happy to contribute to my projects. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Sudhir, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Veta, uh, Ajay and team. It's, it's good to good to see the progress uh, you're making um, and the commitment to ecosystem over a period of number of years now. So uh, my role in, in Capgemini, I'm a technology chief technology and innovation officer for uh, financial services uh, global business. What it means is I'm responsible for uh, anything and everything that happens new, new and next we define in terms of technology, innovation and fintech ecosystem. So pleased to be here and uh, join this panel and share my views. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. Um, Melissa, are you here? Melissa, yes, over to you. So Melissa, if you can just help us with a brief introduction of yourself. 
Sure. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we can all use some great conversation as a break from uh, what everybody's dealing with. Um, my name is Melissa Frackman. I'm general partner of Emphasis Ventures EMVC. We are a fintech focused early stage venture fund focused on emerging markets with a very strong India focus and sort of India centric view of global fintech innovation. We have over 18, nearly 20 portfolio companies of India fintech companies, both consumer and B2B, as well as do occasional growth stage investments. I've been working in the India financial services ecosystem for over 15 years. Thank you, Melissa. So with that, I'll move on to my first question. And this first question is directed to all, uh, all the three of my panel members. So we all know digital is here to disrupt and will continue to disrupt the way businesses are done within the broader BFSI space. So what are the trends that you see are shaping the evolution of the fintech industry that, and, that you think is going to continue over the course of next 10 years? Maybe Vivek, we can start with you again. Sure, sure. Uh, probably just to respond to it, uh, the fintech industry, when we call it uh, over a period of time, it has become a lot more difficult to define what is that industry. Uh, and probably a balanced way to look at it is all stakeholders uh, could be incumbents, could be banks, insurance, asset managers, and BFCs, uh, could be startups, uh, could be adjacent industry digitizers, like so, let's say Swiggy, Zomato, Uber, uh, now, anyone who is, uh, in my view, creating uh, seamless products and services targeted at the underserved uh, should be in that definition called it. And uh, if, the, if the delivery model and the unit economics are in a certain way, then they do get valued and looked at up in a different way. right? So I think if we paint that picture and not just focus on startups, uh, then the common trends which everyone is tracking is uh, this is an industry which is driven on data. Uh, so digitization of all value chains and ecosystems is critical. Uh, if, if uh, like we were ch chatting and in the previous panel, we heard Naveen talk about the problem of underserved in rural communities, for example. If you're not able to digitize it, even having a cool app, I will not be able to solve that problem. Uh, so, so digitization is one common theme, if you may, and everyone is trying to find their place into get into, uh, into that space. Now, uh, imperatives might vary by a stakeholder. Now, if I'm an incumbent, I have a, uh, I have a challenge that while I'm seeing the new market opening, I, I still am sitting on legacy cost structures. So how do I play agilely in this new market? How do I change my own culture? Those are the problems I will be dealing with. If I'm a fintech, probably the, there's a problem of plenty. Uh, so if you have a, a, someone who solves one problem before you know that we have around 10, 20 players working on it. And how do we avoid, let's say, uh, someone who raises the maximum cash uh, being the only indicator and how do we make it a more balanced view so that future organizations that can create it is the challenge from that perspective. So I'll be brief. I think those will be a couple of my starting points on what everyone is looking at. Sure. And later in the conversation, we will definitely touch upon these points. Um, so Sudhir, over to you. What are the trends that you see are going to be uh, uh, there over in the coming years? Uh, the, the way... Uh... I've been looking at this for a number of years. Uh, I, I would think the east side, that is primarily this side of the world, you know, India, Asia, I would think the fintech, uh, so-called the innovation here is primarily attributed to, uh, of course, uh, the financial need, well-being, inclusion, and, and driven by data connectivity, uh, smartphones, et cetera. So that was sort of primary driver for uh, the fintech ecosystem. If you look at the West, uh, Western uh, countries, it was more of a value chain disruption. That is, you know, how do I capture a share from bigger players? You know, maybe it is around lending, maybe it is around in onboarding. So the fintechs focused on disrupting that value chain. So that's how it has evolved. But um, over a period of time, I think, as we all know, uh, 2020 is an exception, but, you know, things going forward, uh, some new perspectives are going to come in, in the fintech world. Um, I, I guess we have already spoken about this before, but there's going to be a huge push on redefining the money, you know, how you define money in the future. So, and it is, maybe it is in terms of the actual cash you carry, maybe it is uh, the digital money that you carry. 
uh, or it may be crypto. So the whole uh, you know equation around money is going to come. Uh, so that's one of the things. And the second, I would think there is going to be a lot of responsibility on uh, on financial institutes and and thereby with fintechs to to do some more inroads towards the sustainability angle. You know, maybe around the green products, maybe around um, you know the areas that are impacting. Uh, the sustainable living uh, going forward, including the investment and so on, where where uh, financial institutions have to play a big role, which means fintech will start to you know uh, occupy those sort of a market. So maybe these are a couple of dimensions. I think the evolution will sure. happen going forward. Sure. Uh, Melissa, coming to you uh, with your experience, um, uh, what are the trends that you see which are going to be coming uh, in in the near future? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the, the sentiments and predictions already raised, which are quite comprehensive. I'd say um, in terms of India, and I was going to say it's peer markets, but there really is no peer, but sort of the next five to 10 countries coming up behind India as fintech leaders, I think we're in very early days for this sort of last mile distribution part of the market. In India, that Tier two cities all the way uh, through to rural. You know, there was this first evolution of the MFI ecosystem over the past decade. Now there's a few, a handful of sort of buzzy startups building for next billion users. But there's so much more to do, and it's such early days that I think there's going to be a whole kind of renaissance of deep business model innovation and tech innovation for these users. Um, it's just starting, like in rural, and there's so much to do. Um, and I believe that the first wave of microfinance really didn't fully achieve its mission of digitizing that market. And there's there's a lot more that will be developed. Second, um, businesses and just sort of small business solutions across the board. Um, I predict that a lot of the kind of SME digitization that's happening now is sort of base level. And there's gonna be more niche differentiated point solutions across the value chain for businesses that will get created. Um, and thirdly, uh, I think the sort of cross-border nature of the world, even if you could argue geopolitically, ge um, globalization is reducing in some ways these days, but I think in terms of financial services, we're going to see more um, cross-border activity and more sort of cross-border business models that emerge and collaboration, and that's both because of decentralized finance, but also just kind of the nature of entrepreneurs looking across borders and consumers and small, whether they're individuals is expecting more in terms of a seamless financial services experience across countries. Sure. Um, thank you for sharing that, Melissa. I will definitely come back to you. I have a follow on question to that. But before that, uh, uh, Vivek, coming back to you, we are now seeing uh, this whole new trend of uh, uh, a whole new trend, which is not just in India, but even globally that embedded finance is going to be the next stage in the evolution of the uh, fintech ecosystem. And it is expected to be dominating the industry um, in, in the coming years. Uh, what are your views on this? Sorry, am I audible? Yes, you are. Sorry, I do thought I lost two for me. Uh, so on embedded finance, uh, uh, I think that's one of the pillars where uh, the collaboration that we keep on talking about really uh, uh, gets actionalized. Uh, so to, to just paint the picture, what we mean by embedded finance is uh, when the user needs it, uh, that person should be able to consume a financial product. Uh, and, and really, if you see it from two lenses, from a manufacturing lens, which is all the banks, insurance, uh, let's say NBFC, so manufacturing a financial product, so traditionally, they have relied largely on their own distribution channels. Uh, but what we are seeing as the broader sector gets digitized is there are many other adjacent industries and players who are creating an ecosystem there. So they are creating a connect with their customers. They have the information on the customers. And those are, are the places where a financial uh, product can get plugged in. Uh, we are aware of the situation or of use cases such as Ola insurance or ride insurance or a or a travel insurance, or look at cost-based financing, and you can go across all the product spectrum. Uh, but if you have to put it in a framework, I would say there are three C's to it. it there has to be a context. Uh, it is not as simple as just making a product available, uh, it, and that's a that's more probably art than science uh, in figuring out a need which works in that context. Uh, second is connect, because uh, from a manufacturing perspective, 
uh, what creates a lot more confidence is their partner, the distribution partner truly has a connect uh, because a lot of financial product relationships are not single serve relationships. They are long-term relationships and have a bearing on profitability of organizations. So how strong is that connect? And the third is how strong is the content? The more we have data which is validated, and that's where probably uh, even ecosystem programs like Oaken, et cetera, can have a strong play. Uh, I think those three Cs become important. Also, it's important to recognize the inhibitors from the incumbent organizations because a lot of fintech distributors are still relying and probably for in the near and uh, long term, uh, the existing manufacturers will have a big role to play. But when we talk on the incumbent side with many banks, and especially we go into public sector banks and, and within traditional banks as well, they have their traditional sales channels. And as a banker, you really trust what you touch. So how do you earn that trust? Uh, and how do you ensure that your policies on cyber, on governance, on uh, customer grievances, complaints is aligned? Because once you become a partner, uh, it's a shared fate. I think those are the complexities and inhibitors one has to kind of work towards. Uh, but my advice would be, this would be the, the biggest space where we see business building out. And even if you look at last one year, a fair bit of fundraisers that have happened through a lot of fintech setups. Uh, this has been one of the cases people have been following through. Uh, so whether we are an incumbent or a startup, if you want to focus on this space, I, my advice would be just follow the digitization trail. Uh, and a lot of excitement and, and definitely get into the industries and ecosystems which are traditionally called boring. Uh, take utilities. A lot of utility payments are being managed by distribution companies in state-run organizations. And, and massive change is happening in there uh, because instead of giving subsidies to the, the middle people, now the subsidies will go to the end consumers. So And, and many of these organizations are sitting on huge basis. Agri is again a big value chain. Education, where we know a fair bit of digitization has happened. Uh, while well, a lot of voice is uh, created on, on, let's say, extended education or small courses, uh, but really the big change happening under the hood is all the colleges, institutions are adopting ERPs, they are adopting digital payment modes, they are adopting uh, learning management solutions. Uh, so yes, there are challenges because many of those ecosystems still are fragmented, uh, but as they start getting digitized and as uh, people start uh, figuring out models which are managing the risk perceptions of incumbents uh, with the reach and data of the distribution partners, I think we, we can see a lot more excitement there. Sure. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Vivek. So they're coming to you. Given your experience in the, uh, in the broader BFSI space, and this is not just in India, but this is globally, across multiple uh, BFSI companies that you uh, you work with. I'm sure you, you get to witness a lot of uh, uh, behavior from the different stakeholders very closely. Um, how do you think the decade is going to impact all those different uh, stakeholders like consumers, lenders, borrowers, regulators, uh, SMEs, banks? Um, and how is the next uh, 10 years going to transform the way they relate to FinTech or uh, financial industry? Yeah. Uh... Thank you, thank you, Shweta. It's it's uh, it's really an important one and uh, uh, a, a broad question uh, to answer. But let me let me give you a couple of perspectives. So no matter how you look at it, I would think that uh, financial services will have to look look out for uh, avenues to, you know, new avenues towards new business models. That means you know you have seen in Asia uh, primarily when China through China, you know, you, they the whole super apps uh, started to grow uh, faster and faster right so it's not just not just for consumers but also uh, you know it's a new business model where you do not necessarily invest on a whole lot of marketing dollars for yourself right so you you rely upon others so so someone will be a producer someone else will be a consumer uh, so I, I would think from an incumbent perspective um, all around the world uh, there are a couple of uh, dimensions banks are taking first one is to see um, can they increase uh, the distribution network of their existing product services? Uh, uh, and, and that is either through partnership with big technology companies and thereby they get access to millions of consumers uh, or by looking for uh, you know, uh, other sector, cross-sector partnership. So um, one good example I can give because it's fresh in my mind that a number of uh, insurers have uh, approached uh, where 
insurer and automotives would like to join hands you know towards the whole lot of telematics uh, area because um, when we started this conversation interestingly it started as a telematics but end of the day it, it ended up as a data uh, strategy right so end of the day who owns the data and how the data can be uh, stored and communicated etc again the reason i'm giving this example is here a consumer has to play a role uh, insurer has to play a role automotive company has to play a role the oem software vendor has a role now uh, the, the question is uh, who who owns the risk uh, and in what context you know who play pays uh, you know premium are you paying premium for us for the car or for the software running in the car uh, about the cyber etc so i would think we are going to see more and more uh, convergence of this so called the intelligent industry development in other industries and impact of that in financial services now purely on consumer you asked uh, i think consumers uh, we have seen and we, we recently had a survey as well the behavior of consumer is all going towards uh, you know we call it as more and more demanding uh, experiences uh, which they see from everywhere and they would like to see it even from banking institutes uh, we have seen the shift in the behavior the consumption patterns um, we call it a digital alter ego meaning consumers are okay to have a chatbot and uh, a human interactions together etc cetera, etc cetera. the other point uh, shweta would like to make uh, is there's going to be a big paradigm shift in regulatory uh, elements as well right so uh, and and those are uh, mainly data driven compliance regimes uh, and even regulatory aspects that are driven by private sector right so when when tesla made announcements that they're going to receive bitcoin payments for the car or when paypal made an announcement that they're happy to exchange crypto versus uh, the actual currency then suddenly you know regulators have to worry about what does it mean uh, uh, to them right so how will this whole thing changes and you have seen number of times facebook making an attempt this is the second or third attempt to run uh, a stable coin right that they want to launch it and so on so there's going to be immense pressure on that regulatory uh, ecosystem uh, because of consumers because of big technologies and between all these things banks will continue to find their way either by partnering or by competing or by acquiring and do you see um, any uh, so we, we all know regulation is uh, is something that has always uh, um, restricted fintechs to go out and uh, explore and do uh, in in terms of uh, innovation go out and explore and do um, do you think uh, over the next decade are we going to see any uh, any positive change in terms of regulators coming forward and easing out uh, a little bit role in terms of helping these fintechs go out and um, um, uh, and serve the uh, serve the nation with uh, with the innovation is that for all of us oh, oh, i was i was just extending that uh, to to okay yeah. look uh, 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 melissa can join uh, i i just wanted to say that you may have to rethink about what does regulation mean right in my view going forward regulate regulatory and compliance elements are more and more towards will be geared towards data okay and uh, towards consumer protection data protection uh, consent you know more and more towards that because uh, there is going to be surge of data there is going to be uh, it's going to be available it's going to be shareable and exchange and whatever no matter how you want to restrict be, be it based on country boundaries or be it based on regional uh, which will be there uh, even for fintechs it's not going to never going to be a global universal uh, but there are going to be some standards uh, which are going to be accepted globally like we already seen uh, you know the standards uh, for tokens like uh, erc standards uh, which means it is pretty much global like http today we use anybody can use anywhere however there's going to be more restricted uh, data related regulation uh, that that would be uh, specifically driven by country specific uh, regional specific regulators um melissa vivek uh, would you like to add comments to this question melissa ping boy sure i'd say only a slight note to it to your to your question about regulation is that from my perspective obviously there's challenges especially for early earlier stage fintechs actually and the incumbents so there's challenges for everybody across the board operating in a highly regulated space like bfsi 
That being said, Indian regulators are still, when you stack them sort of up against global regulators in the sector, very focused on their kind of dual role of sort of market development and encouraging innovation. And so obviously it's not perfect. There's lots of small requests we would given the opportunity that would help encourage additional in, uh, innovation and make it easier for fintechs across sectors. There's been so many things over the past few years that have enabled new startups to come up and even some of the embedded finance stuff that Vec was talking about is, is um, available in India and to kind of consumers of those infrastructure products because of the way the current regulatory regime is as it relates to being open source for payments and ID and EKYC and everything else. So looking forward to more sort of regulatory developments in this space and the regulators being increasingly open to engaging with industry earlier in the policy making process or rule making process, but uh, it's it's quite encouraging how supportive they already are for FinTech. So I just want to add that in my view, uh, it's, a, it's a little more uh, complex uh, uh, layout right now than even like a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. uh, if you reverse back to a couple of years back, really all regulators everywhere were trying to solve for uh, saying, okay, how do we uh, foster the ecosystem? How do we uh, monitor it? How do we kind of get ahead of the trends? And that led to the, the popularization of sandboxes, which most of the Indian regulators have also launched, uh, and which is a good trend, right? Uh, the other trend which was continuing, which I think will have more uh, uh, legs as we move forward is the whole area of subtech, uh, which was one of the categories which were created within FinTech, which was supervisory technologies. It is a kind of tech which the regulators would use to uh, increase their efficacy of regulation and probably reduce the cost of compliance, like trying to balance out both, both areas. Now, while those are operational things which will continue, but I think every regulator Today is grappling with a couple of more issues. Uh, one, which I think is more linked to geopolitics, which is around data localization. Uh, but that will have a bearing on how we can seamlessly leverage innovation across geographies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 in short term, it can be an impact. But in long term, if we talk about India as a country, and we believe that the future economy is going to be built on data, and data is a new oil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then there could be uh, there could be some advantages of building a whole ecosystem around it. But yeah, data data privacy, how to execute it, uh, how to execute it at a population scale, uh, where both uh, uh, financial literacy and broader literacy is still quite varied, uh, is going to be a, a big challenge for our time, times, and probably will take uh, half a decade, a decade to really solve for it. Uh, the second big and hairy issue in front of us is around crypto. Uh, uh, which again, uh, uh, there is a fair bit of policy activity happening on India as well. Uh, and then probably my advice there would be to, to look at it from two cents, whichever way, and it is, a, it is almost becoming a political issue now, uh, whether you are for it or not for it. Uh, but if I try to take a balanced path, uh, I would advocate that on one trend, uh, let's, let's track the efforts being done on CBDC, uh, uh, the central bank digital currencies. I would think whatever way was being done in last couple of years, has been more of pilots, uh, but if I have to do crystal ball raising, I think the time has come. Uh, we are seeing very tangible use cases. Uh, uh, Sudhir mentioned earlier, different payment methods like cash, uh, account-based payments and others. Uh, even in an Indian setup, uh, a digital currency, which you will be in a mobile phone, if it is secure, and we have done pilots where it can work across feature phones as well, can, can truly give a uh, boost to our UPI framework if we, if we play that right. Uh, and the second part of it is uh, non-CBDC related currencies. Uh, there, I would say every country will have to uh, take its own call because everyone is solving different problems. Uh, in India now, especially after UPI, P2P is not really a problem for us. But in many other countries who do not have such real-time agile population scale systems, which really talk with each other, so that's a problem to solve for. Uh, so everyone will have to choose their bets. Uh, at the same time, uh, the challenge is one thing which unifies all humanity is uh, uh, is really the uh, the speculative element of uh, of not like the whole FOMO piece, or whether you will miss out making money or can missing the bus, which is I think causing a bit of a gold rush out there. So that's an area which I would be a little cautious about. Where I would feel everyone has to take their use cases of where it makes sense. Uh, 
Uh, but CBDC is one which uh, will strongly advocate on, on that front to uh, really everyone start putting their thoughts together and uh, how we can leverage that thought more. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Vivek. And I, I think the whole decentralized finance, you know, they're different maturity at different uh, countries. But uh, if, if, I am, if I'm an entrepreneur, if I'm looking for fintech for the next uh, few years that some, something will kick up, I think this will be around, around this area. And a little bit broadly as well, as you know, most of the banks now slowly started to even publish the custody solutions. That means what banks are saying is, if the large investments are going to happen in crypto, then I should be the safekeeping uh, organization for that. That means I should be able to store it, retrieve it, et cetera. So there's huge movements around newer distributed ledger decentralization technologies towards the safekeeping and crypto custody as well. That's again, a, a, an interesting area for fintechs to look into. An idea on, on top of what Sudhir mentioned, uh, a, a new industry, and today we focus too much on the currency, uh, but it is going to create a lot of new roles. Uh, the example is Sudhir gave where a bank can become a custodian as a role. Uh, we are seeing in, in Europe where pilots have been done. As you move physical assets onto digital assets and get loaded on a blockchain, uh, there's a whole set of uh, organizations emerging who are asset validators because it's, it is immutable when it comes on. So suddenly we will have folks who need to confirm an asset. So every industry will break a few uh, silos, but will also create a few silos. Uh, we, are, we are working in a closed bubble. Uh, so, so what are those new silos being created out of the worthwhile ones to watch out for? Sure, sure. So, uh, uh, Melissa, coming to you, that brings me to my next question. Uh, we've seen in India about 32 unicorns in total. And uh, uh, over the past uh, a few months, we have seen uh, uh, at least uh, 10 of them who have come in the past couple of months, right? Uh, and out of this, eight of the companies are uh, fintech companies. So we've seen about 60% increase in the investments that has been happened in the fintech space uh, compared to last year. What do you think is the funding pipeline uh, look like um, in the future for fintechs and how, how is it evolving? Yeah, well, in the short term, it's evolving as we've all seen in Shweta, as, as you described, where there's just a lot of liquidity in the market and, and global capital focus on fintech, not just in India, but everywhere. So this boom of fintech, not just unicorn making rounds, but sort of any like ultra large rounds happening is not an India phenomenon. That's a global fintech phenomenon right now in terms of the capital of it available. Of course, it's um, further accelerated by how exciting sort of the market in India is when global investors look at the fundamentals of the economy, et cetera. Plus um, there being sort of less opportunities in other markets like China or Europe where they would also be looking for, for FinTech um, companies. Of course, it's always important to mention in these kind of conversations that funding is just fuel for the companies to actually achieve and execute what they're setting out to do. So these number of unicorns that have been created in the past few months and that will be announced in the next few months are only kind of like bookmarks on the path to building very lasting, extremely large, uh, sustainable fintech businesses in India. We believe that's happening, but not all kind of in the past month. And um, I think that the, the largest global capital is cyclical in India and kind of comes and goes usually in a two, three year cycle. So it's not gonna be forever that the Tigers and SoftBanks are doing very large nonstop FinTech and InsureTech deals. But to entrepreneurs listening, you know, don't let that, don't let that be a bellwether for kind of the prospects for the companies and, and what's happening because I think the trend is is moving towards the fact that this is going to keep happening in India. Um, the world has finally seen and global capital markets have finally seen how much potential there is. Um, but even in the phases where there aren't these mega rounds kind of readily available to, to entrepreneurs, um, there's going to be a renewed emphasis on building sustainable businesses, on getting to revenue earlier in the process as opposed to building for growth only for the first five rounds. Um, and we'll see some kind of new, very scrappy kind of gritty businesses that don't get these mega funding rounds outlast some of them, you know, and, and see them really thrive because of the revenue models that they're able to generate and able to crack um, not just the scale that India brings, but also kind of healthier margins 
on their business and take rates to be able to, to build lasting businesses. Okay. Uh, so just um, uh, my, my next question, uh, uh, adding to you as well. Uh, so historically we've seen um, re banks have been very regional and technology companies have had a global mindset wherein they build for, uh, not just for one particular country or region, but they, they build for the global market. And financial services as a business is highly regulated, right? As we were discussing earlier on the panel, each country has its own uh, regulations, which is different. And it, it becomes very difficult for, uh, for a bank or a FinTech who's uh, working in one country to offer the same services in other country um, because of the regulations, right? Uh, what do you think is the future of FinTechs? Are they going to follow uh, the, tra uh, the trajectory of banks or uh, the technology companies of being, uh, uh, of having the global market? Mindset. And this question I will uh, direct to all three of you. Maybe we start with Melissa. Oh, that's great. It's nice to go before both of you so that you haven't <laughs> given your compre fully comprehensive. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, the answer is there's enough to go around that everything will be created. There's going to be very niche fintechs that do their thing, serve their one specific customer or use case or solve their problem specifically. And they can be a partner to the banks and to the large platform plays or super apps. And then there are going to be many fintechs that go down a kind of cross product path that may look something like banks in the future, whether or not they call themselves banks. But even more so to me where things are going is true, true meaning of embedded finance. By the way, to add to Vivek's earlier response, everything he said was spot on obviously about um, embedded finance, but it's also kind of the hot buzzy trend in India. So I meet 10 startups a month that are not actually embedded finance that are calling themselves right that, that right now um, because it's such a, bu a buzzword like neobanks a year ago or blockchain a year before that. Um, but but I, I think where the future of this is all going is true embedded finance, meaning that literally every not just the ones within fintech are going to be fintech and going to have some angle of lending some angle of sort of data and transaction processing and payments integrated and that's where everything is sort of going to head is, is major kind of consolidation and blurring the lines between sectors um, to give a more kind of seamless con commerce transactional experience to add on to probably my I just want to uh, comment that uh, uh, it's actually a very interesting one. And again, within the banking space also, uh, we haven't had one formula. We have had uh, specific global banks, uh, but almost all global banks took out uh, uh, global with a local flavor. And there was a specific reason for it. One reason was regulation. Uh, the other reason is uh, financial services is still a services industry. Uh, so there is a lot of relationship angle involved, there's a lot of context involved. Uh, so probably some products, uh, for example, take cross-border payments uh, or, or payments and cross-border payments. Like those have a lot more uh, probably uh, uh, transplantability across geographies. So my, if the regulations are harmonized to some degree, let's say, let's say they are solved for, uh, you can imagine payment companies almost uh, uh, getting into countries the way social media companies get into countries. Right, or uh, or e-commerce organization getting to different countries that can be imagined. But some other products such as, and especially if you study into corporate spaces, a uh, little more difficult. Uh, so I would, if I have to wager, I would say probably it will follow a similar trend as we saw in banking. Uh, some would aim to become global, but with local touches. And some people will remain local. Some people can become regional. Uh, I don't think the, the fundamentals have changed as much. And if you link to the previous problem of uh, gated global data localization. Uh, so earlier on we had physical barriers, now we have digital barriers. So, uh, cause the human motivations don't really change, technology might change. So uh, I would wager that it, it will not be too dissimilar. Sure. So Vivek, uh, look, uh, my, my view on this, uh, topic is, you know, it depends on how much tech fin you are uh, versus how much fin tech you are. What I mean by that is if you are starting with a strong technology uh, and data to solve a problem, then your likelihood of expanding uh, that to, to other geographies or other regions uh, is 
uh, um, is quite natural right so and we have seen how some of the so called the neo bank uh, fintechs who who literally became a bank uh, have started as more on the technology side right so as a technology platform and then slowly slowly start to add more financial products and services became a bank um, then became a licensed bank etc and slowly they started to move with that to other geographies because uh, the core philosophy of what they are trying to solve be it lending or be it uh, payments etc Uh, has been already built in so I, i would think that sort of a, a natural progression uh, is going to happen uh, because most of the fintechs are going to be data and tech led anyways um, going forward so uh, that's what my my thinking is at the moment sure sure uh, so in the interest of time let's open it up for questions maybe we'll take a few questions from the audience so uh, audience if anyone wants to ask a question either raise your hand or put it in the chat window okay we have one question here from manoj and the question is what do you see on sme lending especially on onboarding and credit monitoring vertical or horizontal or on different distribution channels I can take a stab at it, and uh, uh, Melissa, so we can add on. Uh, so, couple of trends there, and I'm glad it was brought up because many times when we have a fintech conversation, so much of it is focused on retail. Uh, but SME and corporate is again a big area, and I think the opportunity is bigger. Uh, so, there are a few trends that we are seeing there. Uh, one is the basic thesis of embedded finance holds. Uh, so, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, so, I think the way the, the the oldest one would be the way. A lending cart, uh, Neo, and couple of these uh, the initial fintech lenders really got up, and that was because Amazon and Flipkart and other e-commerce organizations had created a good MSME ecosystem around it. And suddenly we had data, and this was a personal anecdote where when I used to go to my neighborhood market, uh, the guy who used to sell utensils there, he told me over the last three four years now almost fifty to sixty percent of his sales has really moved online. In shop, it's like having the same conversation, but he's also supplying now to online organization. But you see, from a credit perspective, the same person three years back, if you if he really wanted to apply for credit, uh, a bank would surely have asked for probably collateral, including a shop. Uh, but now, since the data is available, that data becomes a, a good proxy, and because he's on a platform, a platform becomes a good security uh, for. Uh, For a lender to want to do it, right? So, the, so that thesis, I think, in different shape and forms, continues. Uh, there are a lot of operational uh, nuances there. There are things like FLDG, who will take the risk, uh, who will do the collections, who will do the onboarding processing. So, there are a lot of nuances which vary from a case to case. But that one, uh, some that that pattern is replicating. Uh, the other pattern which we have seen, and I'm a lot more bullish about, is where financial institutions are taking technology partnership bets. Uh, to go deeper into a certain ecosystem. Uh, so again, this is public domain. I can share. So if you look at what ICICI did with a partner called Arteria, and they've invested in them. So uh, it's a it's an ICICI affiliate organization now. But Arteria effectively is a tech company which really uh, implements supply chain solutions for secondary sales. Um, now the partnership there is as that solution gets implemented in the market. Uh, the option is given to the secondary sales participants, who could be warehouse owners, logistics providers. Distributors, so on and so forth. But the data exists. The history is there. The connect is there. The platform security is there, and you can now start offering one-click financing. Uh, the third piece would be to, uh, to mention the trade platform, uh, which is where all the trade invoices are being posted on, and uh, you can plug onto the platform. And then probably uh, GST is a great example where again we have seen some traction, but can grow because all anything which formalizes this. Confirms that the data is authentic and the relationship exists. It really is a boon for embedded finance. Uh, so challenges do happen. I think uh, the biggest challenge is, and we sometimes miss out in this conversation. Uh, when we talk about regulatory and tech, we talk about supervision, we talk about onboarding, KYC. Uh, but something which can really support on the collection side, because uh, that's where a lot of challenges. And uh, if everyone is on digital platforms, then probably that can be a moat. But we are in this hybrid world where some people are more digital, some people are not. 
so how do you really create security how do you what happens like what happened with nfi sometime back what happens if there is a wave of non repayments uh, what are the protections against those i think those are the things which have to be thought more but uh, probably those are my top couple of thoughts there sure we have two more questions from vishwanath his first question is will nft play and nft continues to be a hot topic will nft play a role in fintech if so what scenarios will will get impacted and his follow on is will india miss the crypto wave so either of you i so let me let me take a step and then can be turned so nft is a uh, uh, Hundred percent sure. Uh, NFT, there is a big role for for fintechs to play. Now, uh, the role can change uh, from what we think today is your role versus over the next uh, few months or few years. Uh, most of the NFTs today are still in the exploratory state. That means, uh, you know, you start with the marketplace, you uh, create an opportunity to tokenize uh, the assets, and you know, create the standards. Uh, the erc standards and then you know you offer uh, you know ability to list and auction and so on now there are two ways i would look at if i am a fintech you know what are those um, asset classes that i can probably vouch for and be very famous for um, that's 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 one way to look at um, uh, or the second uh, i will look at is uh, which which area i will play do i need to play in the uh, issuance side or do i need to play in the exchange or you know capital market side or do i need to play in the settlement side so i'll i'll see what value of uh, um, the value stream that i would like to play uh, the the fintech card with um, uh, this is very fascinating because even today there are some of the fintechs were thinking about and you have seen these are all billion dollar plus valued valued companies now Uh, is also to look at complete virtual. Um, uh, you know that means I can virtually create a real estate, buy a house, have an art. Uh, you know, sell it to somebody. So the whole economy uh, can be virtual and it can be traded as well. So these are all started as a very unique um, companies, and now they are uh, going under very high valuation. So I, I would think this area is building very fast, and it doesn't matter whether it is India or elsewhere. There is definitely a role for for uh, for an entrepreneur to play here. Sure. To further Sudhir's point, I, I would just add that um, I agree with that completely. And you know, intellectual property is a problem in India in general for innovation and for um, startups. You know, enforcement of new ideas, new kind of creative developments. And the ability for NFTs as they develop to help um, generate kind of ownership data and uh, credit where credit is due, if you will, for creators kind of across different industries who create things that um, allows for more data to serve them with BFSI. So that means you can start paying the folks that create the things that go viral within pop culture in India. Or you can start lending to them, um, or create products around them. And I think it's very early days, but there's a lot to be done around that stuff. And I'd say, will India miss the crypto wave? No, but if things don't move quickly, there's a potential to. There's lots of brilliant Indian minds building in crypto outside of India's borders right now, because that's where they have to be. And so, seeing the sort of reverse brain drain of lots of folks coming back to the market and building to solve inherently Indian problems will be a great thing when it happens. So just to supplement that uh, on the leg, I was uh, intrigued by the second part of the query, uh, and uh, so two thoughts there. Right, one is uh, we have to look at market applications as relevant to every country. Right, uh, are we worried that we are missing the speculative wave, or are we worried that we are missing the use cases? Uh, now, and if it is use cases, then let's put our energy behind CBDC and see what we can build on top of it. uh the second is sometimes a lot of money is built on boring businesses uh so to melissa's point and adding on to it i would think uh, we have had at the position of being the technology providers for the whole world let us start providing crypto technology to the whole world so there is no reason why people out of india can't develop applications because i do think honestly that different geographies or locations will build applications as relevant for them there are some common themes like crypto exchanges uh but if you just go away from saying that it is all about trading money and let's say what i want to do with it 
So let us find local applications. But a real opportunity, I believe, is let's convert all our IT parks to crypto IT parks and become the development for crypto for the whole world. I think that's a seat we can take, and that doesn't require any regulation. Yeah, and 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 I hundred percent agree with that, uh, Vivek. And it, it, to be honest, there was a very similar discussion on sustainability as well, right? So can India take lead in becoming the technology and data partner for sustainability because there's such a huge market. Uh, out there so most of the companies today have defined the goals defined the purpose defined the business kpis uh, poured a lot of money uh, but that would require a significant um, sort of back end uh, support and it will also require significant support from uh, you know uh, the overall it landscape technology landscape perspective and that market is going to open up uh, quickly, uh, both India as in as a country as well as from India to to elsewhere. So we can we can lead the way there. Yeah. Vishwanath asked a question which is quite pertinent that we are still talking about services and not products. Completely fair point. It's a uh, uh, overall to become a product nation is a largely a different kind of a journey for sure. Having said the other piece which sometimes we forget and and really the government is keen to. Uh, promote it and uh, we have to find models by which it will work is now we have an opportunity with having two regulators. Uh, we have RBI for doing what we do in India, but we have for the IFSC International Financial Services Center. Uh, so the I'll, I'll just uh, go ahead with the next fireside chat that we had planned. Uh, we are not giving this a topic because we went a little bit back and forth. Just going to call it fintech and uh, COVID-19. Um, if I can have with me on screen, Ganesh, there you go, Ganesh is there on screen, and uh, Ram Gopal from Perfios. There you go. Uh, Shweta, are we being joined by Abhishek? Shweta, if you're there. Cool. Okay. Let's on. Yeah, Shweta, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Is Abhishek joining us? Sorry, Ajay, I didn't realize. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize. No, Abhishek, unfortunately. Cool. That's, that's good. Okay. Uh, so great. So uh, Ganesh, uh, Ram Gopal, welcome on, on stage. Uh, I think we'll just keep this topic uh, a little bit fluid. Let us call it uh, FinTech and uh, COVID-19 and let us go through some of the, the points that uh, we briefly probably spoke about. I think we are a little bit constrained on time with uh, Ganesh as well. So if you can very quickly, Ganesh, introduce yourself, Kona Capital, and Ram, if you can talk about Perfios, I think that can be a good starting point. Ganesh, over to you. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks, Ajay. Uh, thanks for being flexible and moving things around. I apologize. I have to drop off in 16 minutes. Uh, so um, very quickly, actually, Ajay and I have done this a few times. Uh, Kona Capital is a global fintech fund. We are one of the largest emerging markets fintech VC operating across Asia, Africa, Latin, and Middle East. The focus is really on fintech solutions for masses, uh, and that falls in two categories. The classical fintech, which is, of course, payments, credit for consumers, SMEs, insure tech, wealth, uh, financial advisory, etc. And the other broad category for us has been verticalized finance. I mean, it, it comes in different names, adjacencies, embedded finance. Every year, the name changes. But uh, what we do with it remains the same, which is uh, we look at financial innovation and fintech as a foundation for, uh, for helping solve uh, everyday life solutions across verticals. So whether it's mobility, agri, education, healthcare, retail, supply chain, et cetera. So it's financial innovation in that context. That's kind of the other stream. Uh, about 42 portfolio companies across the 14 countries now, and India, Brazil, and Indonesia are the top three countries. Uh, back to you, Rajay. Thank you. Uh, Ram Gopal, you want to take a stab at uh, talking about yeah, what uh, does. Thanks, Ajay. Yeah. Uh, so, thanks a lot. So, Perfuse is a 12 year old company. Uh, so, we had a very interesting journey, and most people probably know us as a bank statement analysis company. Uh, we obviously do a lot more than that. Uh, we work with, uh, I think, more, uh, we work with pretty much most financial institutions banks, NBFCs, fintechs in India. And now we are also present in another 12 countries in Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So the problem that we have largely solved for us, how do you digitize data, right? And then and then build analytics on top of it. And uh, 
because just a part is as people think about digital transformation one of the big aspect of uh, the transformation is digitization of information right and interestingly yesterday shiv was talking about the fact is digitization is a technology problem whereas a digital transformation is a business problem right so what we were able to help a lot of our customers do was do this transformation in the two senses by bringing the technology uh, so that's all it is um, so that is where it is and thanks for inviting me for the panel so i just dive straight in so ganesh I'll, i'll come to you with this one so it's not the strongest of the species that survive no, neither the most intelligent ones it's the ones who are most adaptable to to change and i think uh, there's no better time to than now to kind of uh, articulate this uh, because most of the the adaptable brands will always continue to remain people first they will be driven by community they will be mission led and at the same time they will continue to meet what the the demands uh, of the the society are. so while we keep talking about uh, how uh, we have all kind of moved forward i think to 2025 or 2030 in terms of uh, consumer behavior and and how digital is kind of uh, making this this change rapid i think from a financial industries or financial services uh, perspective what are some of the most notable changes and adaptations that you have seen whether within your portfolio or at the industry at large uh, which can uh, delve upon the the adaptability part so ganesh if you can go first sure um, ajay i think um, i think first and foremost uh, we see lot more emphasis across portfolio on uh, mental health Uh, secondly we seen lot more even though people don't see, see each other um, enough uh, anymore we still seen lot better camaraderie within the teams um, uh, especially uh, you know uh, obviously given the times but it's one thing to expect that and, and obviously very different to see it in action uh, third is uh, again there are lot you know a lot of finer points uh, across the value chain of payments or credit or digital transactions um savings investments etc where behavioral change has, has, has traditionally been so hard and we are seeing things uh, you know in, in the last few months we have seen things change which probably uh, uh, folks have been trying to educate the customers or 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 financial or large incumbent financial institutions for years in some case maybe even for a decade and we have seen that the, some of those behaviors change um, you know in the matter of few weeks sometimes or even if you have a couple of months um um at the and in general i would say uh, digitization adoption uh, ad- uh, adoption of digitization by small businesses has been extremely rapid i think on the consumer side we had seen lot more earlier also but the adoption on the small business side has been quite rapid I and mean, people are suffering and struggling a lot but they are really figuring out creative ways to go digital um and and in some cases value chains which were entirely offline um we're starting to see a lot better handshake between digital and physical uh, in the sense that you can completely uh, do your order management inventory management invoice management uh, reconciliation etc digital and only for delivery you figure out a strategy on how 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 you make it happen and again there are three four different ways to do that so we are seeing a lot of things uh, around us change like never before i think uh, uh, now with the kind of um, sustained impact of covid i think lot more of this behavior will stick because once people realize how easy certain things are there is no reason to sort of go back i think uh, 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 but but having said that um, you know um, this is by far toughest of times that lot of lot of folks have seen so um, uh, i think in a few weeks time if things are looking lot better the promise in the long term sust- sustainability of number of these initiatives will be i think lot more lot better appreciated quite honestly ramgopal if you want to add to that yeah so now i see I, what i would say is uh, what we have seen with all of our customers right i mean first of all obviously as an organization we were able to quickly pivot right because we started off small so we were always on cloud so it was not a big challenge for us to this thing but here again we had interesting problem so we have one part of our business as we do this whole thing processing we are processing because it's still large percentage is print printed documents okay now for to have a complete solution for our customers we could not just say that i'll only do either the user consent based or e statements so it looks alright now we were able to move this team completely to work remotely and uh, these are what 
these are BCOM, BAF kind of folks who are all, obviously we do have, have a lot of control mechanisms in place to ensure that the data is secure, right? And the processing has been done, but we have been able to do that one migration. We did that like within 10 days, we were able to move people to their hometowns, give them thin laptops so they could connect this product. That's one experience which we saw, uh, but which is ours, but with the customers, I, what I see is in the last 12 months, right? Before that, there was a lot of uh, digital was a tick box, a tick mark in the box, right? Saying that I'm digital, okay. Uh, but now they've realized that this is this is the way to go for. So which means that the focus, strategy emphasis, okay, is been there. So just to get the fact is the same period last year it was a complete period of unknown. And all of us were clueless, right? What is going to happen? I see this current period is uncertainty. Uncertainty, obviously, the stress on the people is all a lot more higher. Okay, because we are not seeing this time. I mean, the numbers that we're seeing is a lot more worse than what we have seen in the last twelve months. Okay, and uh, so, but what we have seen from organizations is they've been able to make that change. I mean, it is not complete. I mean, I'm talking about not small organizations. I'm talking about large banks, right? Okay, large banks. Uh, NBFCs were anyway doing a lot of this stuff, uh, but the banks have actually adopted this one. So whether you look at PSU banks, now at least there are a large four PSU banks who have rolled out programs where they're doing this whole transformation. Private banks have done this one. It has been a lot more on the retail sector, but then we are seeing the shift happening in the SME side of it. So which, which is where they're also trying to see how do I solve for this problem? There are certain aspects of the regulation, which I think is still inhibitors. Okay. And uh, I think there's one more aspect is uh, how do you manage fraud in a digital world? I think as you go digital, you'll start realizing that uh, people get a lot more smarter and then they start gaming the system. But the part is, but uh, I would say it's been a big change in terms of the number of transactions which our banks were doing completely physical to what has shifted to digital. So that's a big uh, shift. And not just in India, we also see this trend in Southeast Asia. Sure. Uh, I'll take that and from some of the points that uh, Ganesh made on the on the previous question as well. Uh, I think in, in the next 12 months or, or so, I guess, as we all strive to get back to some kind of uh, normalcy uh, and consumer business uh, or consumer facing businesses adjust to the, the digital adoption that has come by in the, in the last few quarters. Uh, from a financial service or, or a BFSI perspective, uh, looking at things such as uh, digital payments, which has kind of got accelerated, buy now, pay later, uh, a lot of consumer behavior has kind of altered, not only from a behavior standpoint, but also a consumer expectation standpoint. Now, how has this panned out for, for your portfolio companies in Kona in emerging markets? I know that if you look at Africa, probably the impact is very different than India compared to Southeast Asia. But purely from a consumer behavior perspective uh, and adoption of digital, how has how has this kind of overall uh, come across for your portfolio? Sorry, I was on mute. And there are differences, but also we are seeing you know fairly wide variety of uh, similarities now. Um, I think after uh, when we, we, we you know this is we've gone through a couple of cycles here, right? When the first wave hit, I think last year between. April and May, April and April to June, all the companies hunkered down. I think between July to September, we start seeing most companies come back. By December, Jan, I think almost every company in the portfolio uh, that was doing well, maybe I would say about 85%, um, uh, surpassed their um, Jan to March 2020 numbers. And then uh, number of the companies, so Jan to March 2021 was bread quarter. And then April hit again, right? But this time around, most of the companies have been better prepared. People had put some alternate plans in place, whether it's credit, whether it's sort of delivery models, like we have a bunch of B2B marketplaces uh, infused with FinTech also in portfolio. So I think people are better prepared. They also, even though we are really struggling and going through tough times, I think there is in general a greater degree of calmness uh, this time around. Um, and frankly, I mean, if you ask me, our approach also is business will come back. I don't think we need yeah. to worry about it. We need to really focus on making sure that people people are fine at the end of it, and the uh, the spirit 
and the company spirit prevails so lot number of the companies the motivation is much higher uh, uh, you know frankly this time round in terms of behavior itself the, the essentials behavior is through the roof absolutely through the roof uh, right now um and and demand if you look at credit companies demand is through the roof um obviously lot more stringent uh, filter criteria have been has been put in place so from that perspective people are able to meet targets even as late as mid april in india which is by far now the worst hit country um because you 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 your you know, demand is so high that you can be cautious and still be able to fulfill uh, as a small much smaller portion but still be able to you know reach your targets um there are number of functions we have seen where consumers also become lot more comfortable uh, moving to digital uh, which has actually a shortened the turn around more flexibility and adaptability ajay i think the biggest challenge is there are number of areas where you cannot run life on digital sure. and those are really really at hold uh but and that, but that is more been a business side challenge it's not been as much a consumer side 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 challenge quite frankly i would even say i'm i'm surprisingly even if you take april fashion some of these things the uh, we are seeing lot higher digital and online uh, activity than 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 we ever saw before because number of our companies work with you know online smes etc on the credit side or payment side uh, so on and so forth so it has been really surprising to see the pick up uptick even on uh, even in categories which you wouldn't consider essential in this times ram gopal uh, you want to add to that uh, yeah see uh, I mean, uh, yeah so so i think one of the part is right the consumer behavior has changed and i think uh, the reflect of uh, what we see is a reflection in the bank statement uh, okay. i just think about right I mean, earlier we used to say that for a consumer, typically there are some 10 to 15 transactions in a month, a salaried individual. Okay, they would pay their, uh, they would have the utility bills, they would have some uh, premium being paid on the uh, insurance or an SIP, rent transfer. Okay, I'm sending monies to family members. Right, okay. him, and that's it, right? And then there's a couple of credit which is coming in from uh, either a salary payment or my salary is always there. And then you have uh, interest or something like that from a deposit or something like that. Right? Now, the average number of bank transactions for the same salary customer is increased by eight folds. So you're seeing around eighty to hundred transactions per month for an individual. The ticket size has come down like crazy. so you are seeing swipes for 80 rupees 120 rupees right so which is which clearly indicates that there has been a shift from a cash based model to a more of a digital model so that is the i would say the first big indicator of the consumer behavior shift and so which also means that a lot of segment of customers were considered to be thin files because they did not have group but they were also thin data files the banking did not have much of a transaction like it could be a kirana store it could be the i mean like it's your as simple as the vegetable vendor right i mean my vegetable vendor for the last 12 months has been i've been paying him on a, either a phone pay or a google pay or a paytm right? mm. so which is currently representing a lot of data for them okay so you are able to lot more predict their behavior what is the reputability of their business what is the repeat customers and all this thing so i think data across segments has become lot more richer I, i mean uh, i think covid is done to data which probably demonetization did not do right in terms of digital transformation and all this stuff so i think that's the biggest shift which we see so that is one part of the whole aspect that is a benefit right okay and like uh, and again if i get the april numbers i mean uh, given we have what 200 plus customers in india and the 70 odd in southeast asia we have not seen too much of a dip in volumes the volume dips have happened probably wherever it is still a phys- physical model uh, in terms of this one so the fact that people know that this is something it's a phase that it goes through they will go through there are certain things which will work certain things you have to kind of pause i mean at least if i look at last year or even uh, part of it i like just the fact right i like i'm showing about some of the larger banks even psu banks right their implementations are going on full hold 
but they have got used to this whole webite zoom meeting they have remote access enabled so which means businesses have accepted the way earlier it used to be please come to my office sit out of my office and work from office so from that perspective that's a from an organization perspective financial institution that behavior has changed in a way okay uh so that is the second uh, component and uh, i would say that yes people have become a lot more tighter about uh, risk okay uh, which is where it is and also i mean obviously from nbfcs there was challenges in terms of funding which is which is pre covid itself okay so the concentration of digital especially for the non small size tier right has shifted to the banks you see a lot of volumes are going through banks directly uh, which again which is a uh, part of it which is where is the part in banks have at least this was some i think they were working on some of the rollouts for the last 18 20 months they have accelerated those rollouts okay so they are now seeing more transactions there so that is what i would see the pluses uh, ganesh you have time for one last question you want to drop off Uh, sorry, Ajay. I'm going to drop off. My apologies. Cool. <laughs> not not that. a problem. Not a problem. Really But thank you so much for. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about this. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Uh, so, Ramgopal, I'll just continue with you on the on the last one. So, fintech is uh, is not just about uh, the, the banking and financial services industry. I mean, if you look at it, it's at the core. Of, it's at the core of uh, several industries as an enabler. I mean, yourself as as Perpio is a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, Similarly, I mean, uh, our our friends from companies like Signzy or Open, which is enabling SMEs, and there's so much more out there, right? What more can be done from a fintech perspective to enable businesses manage the current pandemic better, whether today or probably six to twelve months from now? What are the things that fintechs can enable businesses to do better? It's interesting uh, this thing. So if you see that part is. Uh... i think there are still lot of aspects from a digital transformation right okay in terms of uh, which are to be solved for i mean like if you look at uh, as simple as there there's a company which looks at this whole agri mm. agriculture sector in terms of data i think data is still a big area where there is gap but uh, the sec and i think the second element which you have seen is like interestingly when this whole pandemic kicked in right You saw a lot of adoption of uh, chatbot, yeah. yeah. Now and obviously the really good ones which were able to do a very high accurate and also localization coming into play, right? Mm -hmm. Now what we also the, I think the third element where we are we, all of us is waiting for is uh, the whole data aggregation. I mean that one data ecosystem starting off that coming into play that will help and uh, there are solutions that can be built on top of it. Okay. Mm. but i think there's one more area which is a large area where the fintech enablers right especially if you look at the so you had pure play players who were originators like the likes of bank bazaar paisa bazaar and all this thing then you had the fintechs who came in and became verticals in terms of uh, either with partnerships or they were primarily doing still this one but what we have also seen is a shift where more and more there is a bridge being established between industries and finances financial services i mean it started with largely with the e-commerce players in terms of the flipkart and amazon on the seller financing but then it kind of expanded into uh, consumer financing okay but then is also moving towards distribution to next but there are a lot more such industries where there is a need for vertical solutions right i mean whether you look at it in terms of uh, Lots of states, whether you look at it in terms of uh, even, I mean, like pharmaceuticals and other parts of it, right? So, like even from a, and what we also see that is there is a shift away. I mean, like bank would probably be the person who's got the capital, right? But not all banks are going to have a relationship which is directly with customers, and some of the banks are also making making choices based on that. So, which means they're building out infrastructures for like Open is a classic example, right? Or Neo. in terms of the card player uh, but what we see is also enterprises like uh, i think prachi loan has done this very well with tata groups in terms of funding their suppliers okay so uh, if we see this whole open token kind of open trade enablement network i mean that's a very early stages but what i think is uh, taking this beyond being the consumer part of it but more about partnerships right where 
you are because one of the big benefits of partnership is especially let's say when you get a tata steel kind of thing or you are working with a vertical aggregator right they know a lot about the customer there is a lot more data which can come in and you can establish trust which means that you can reduce the risk which a lender sees okay and to a large extent i think the direction forward maybe in the next 2 to 3 years would be a risk based pricing right but for risk based pricing to come in you need lot of uh, partnerships so which is where i see that that is going to be the next wave like i think in the earlier uh, session people were talking about nft right okay if you can establish the authenticity of the borrower right or the applicant or the data i think that is a big challenge because what we see is we see increasing i mean we also saw some of the sad aspects aspects of it with the in december january especially in uh, telangana and andhra in terms of chinese uh, borrowers kind of this one and all this kind of right so i think trust is important in financial services and uh, one is building the trust with the consumer by being a bridge is going to be a big aspect great uh, thank you so much for that uh, i don't have any further questions but we can open it up for the audience if they have uh, maybe a, a couple of questions so uh, people who are still in the room uh, feel free to ask uh, questions maybe we have time for a couple of them Either you can do raise a hand or just bring yourself on the screen and you can introduce yourself and ask the question. You have to drop it as a question in the. Hello. Chat. Yeah. Hey, Bridges. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. uh my question is uh that like we are talking about digitization uh in this pandemic uh, a lot and uh, uh, all the government departments banks uh, they are uh, moving heavily toward uh, digitization now my question to the panel is like uh is to uh, for the kycs and all those the uh, the documents what we we are converging from physical to Uh, digital interface now the question is that how do we uh, address the reliability of those uh, digital informations and where do we see that the authenticity is matched uh, for the different set of documents in fintech because in fintech it's not only a kyc there are whole set of physical documents also, also which are required and then do you see a gap there that yes it needs an authenticity evaluator platform also in between which can uh, validate those documents uh, from uh, physical to digital ones uh, yeah prajesh that's actually a very good question and also that is a current challenge right so if you look at it, there are two parts to it so in terms of identity documents and all obviously for a bank you still have the aadhar pipe to do the kyc but in, the other part of i think the other new area which is being explored is a lot to do with uh, digital auditor right because digital auditor is building out infrastructure to pull data from certified sources whether it is your uh, pan card whether it's your uh, voter id driver driving license or even the ua numbers okay hmm So that is one uh, aspect in terms of ID documents being validated. In terms of financial documents, right? Uh, so one of the things which is kind of long. I mean, the account aggregator has been was issued five years ago. Uh, we have some banks who are on board. I mean, basically participating in the ecosystem to being ready. But that is something which we are hoping that with the account aggregator coming into play, with some of these documents uh, validity, right, and veracity will get addressed. uh so in the absence of it what today is being done is uh, so again this comes a part right what is the most authentic source of reading the data uh, the most authentic source of reading the data is for the user to give consent and fetch from his online institution because whether it is a e statement or a printed statement there is always a room for uh, fraud so that is where it is so you are able to get data from whether it's a gst data through a api mechanism or it is the bank statement with the through the internet banking or even the income tax document or even the mca data coming up right 
So financial documents, most a lot of the financial documents are available today in uh, from the source directly with the user participation. So that is there. Uh, but then, yeah, so beyond that, if you start looking at documents like property documents and others, those are still not being addressed. It is still very early stages. Some, st some states have talked about uh, registrar of this thing is being becoming digitized. Okay, but that's still well, uh, early days. Uh, yeah, actually, Hammer started into this, this particular gap domain only. Uh, uh, putting a blockchain solution on onto the document management. We did some projects with government of India also, but the adaptability is so, so less uh, that these departments or private government, the, they, they actually don't want to move from, they are talking convergence, they are talking mm -hmm. uh, physical to digital, but authenticity, putting a, a, a right platform in between as a barrier, as you said, even a DigiLocker, there is a, a big gap in DigiLocker also, because DigiLocker is just an interface. They pull data via API and present it to the mm. evaluator. So if, a, if there is, a, the authenticity layer is not there, it's missing. So what do you yeah. see mm. in future that these departments, these uh, private players or the government players would the authenticity is a, a, a requirement for them or it is just, it's on the go, whatever is coming is going. See, I think the, one of the things is, uh, was it one of the part that we learned in our experience, right? We are a 12 year old company. I think we were kind of evangelizing what we were trying to do for almost five years. Okay. And then uh, what happens in many of these things, right? You look for some such a story and then you start, then it becomes a spiraling wheel. So, so, uh, so if I look at the part like even six, seven years between what in terms of government focus versus now, there is a impetus to drive these things and businesses are finding challenges. Okay. Now, if there is a specific problem that you're solving, because this is a, I mean, the area that you're in is a, is definitely an area where there is challenge in terms of authenticity of document is still a problem that's completely not solved. Uh, so, I would say that it is, one is obviously some departments will be progressive, even in government, which are going to do this one. Okay. And the moment, and, and like the herd mentality, which is what we are hoping that today in the next few months, herd immunity will come into play and things will be a lot more, stay, uh, I mean, things will be much more better. Uh, I see that part is, once there are one or two success stories, then it becomes a mass adoption, okay. so which is where it is. So that's about it. So there is no easy quick fit solution for all these things. It is about sometimes doing the hard way and keep evangelizing and pushing people to say these words. And then you have to find, a, I would, it is about finding customers who believe that these things have to be done. They become your sponsors. Yeah, true. It's a long way. And as you said, the success story, uh, I'll just quote one. The Startup mm. India, the all startup certificates are coming on blockchain from our platform. Okay. Mm. That's nice. So, which means that if you're even able to expose an API and some of those things, right, by which people can start consuming it, this could fit in into the entire, because most, uh, well, just give you a use case there, right? So today, many financial institutions, especially PSU banks, have a separate program for fintechs. And then they go through the yeah. fintech nomination route, right? Now, they do this whole empanelment or onboarding. If you're able to look at uh, this thing saying that this can fit into this part, which means the fintechs, whether they are, are they qualifying, yeah. under, qualifying under the program and all this in terms of the play, right? So that would be a case which can then extend into the fintech financing. That's another space, right? By financial institutions and other things coming to me. Yeah. Right. Uh, any any other question? Uh, if we just have time for one more question and then we move to the last segment. Anyone has a question, you can unmute yourself, come on screen and, and ask. Okay. So, I don't 
don't think anyone is asking questions. So, so thank you so much, Ramgopal, for sharing perspectives from Perfio. So, and also uh, earlier uh, being on the on the chat with uh, Ganesh and, and sharing perspectives from an industry standpoint. Thank you so much for your time. Right. Um, thank you. Thanks, sir. So, with that, we'll move to the the last segment. Uh, Sumit, do you want to come on screen as well? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, and Nitesh as well. So, if uh, you guys want to lead this, and then I, I just jump in with the presentation. You want to you want to start? Uh, sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, uh, like giving a bit of a background in terms of like where exactly this whole thing started. I recollect our conversations a couple of months back where uh, we have been discussing in terms of our experience of building Fintigrate and other fintech properties uh, within this domain, setting up corporate accelerator programs, innovation programs for financial institution banks, and that's where we realized the whole power of collaboration and the power of network effects which this uh, uh, industry has it and and i i believe that this is the major industry which has lead an example of like collaboration to cooperation uh, in in a much more uh, matured way at a global scale and not just at a local scale and that's where we first uh, like uh, went down to the blackboard we understood in terms of what exactly uh, we can build a, up ahead here and that's where we just uh, came up with lots and lots of processes and iterations we came up with this whole platform of fintech oi out here and uh, like over to you ajay in terms of like uh, taking it taking us ahead so i'll just do a screen screen share So uh, thank you, Sumit, for uh, giving that quick background. I'm sure it was not two months. It was a little bit longer than that, where we've been discussing and getting our brains together, Shweta, yourself, Nitesh, myself. So FinTech OI is here. And, and like Sumit mentioned, the, the whole objective is how can we try and accelerate the FinTech ecosystem in India and beyond. Um, so just, just to very quickly kind of uh, get into a little bit of background. So as Startup Rezo, uh, while we are built on the founding pillars of Startups First, uh, and in our parlance, when we're talking of startup, we're talking of uh, companies which are largely B2B enterprise tech, selling to large corporates, and four things or four pillars around which the business is centered, which Sumit also spoke about in the beginning, uh, enterprise capital markets and uh, services that, that we offer. While we are not, while we are headquartered in Mumbai and a lot of our work is focused on India, there is a fair amount of action that uh, we are experiencing and we are doing in in Southeast Asia and, and in Africa. So uh, we are looking at ourselves as as someone who keeps uh, plugging away and and doing this this work in in emerging markets and South South. The UN designated South South is what we are focusing on. So that is that is who we are. That is what we are. Um, and these are the four pillars like I like I spoke about. So we, we continue to work with large corporates and setting up corporate accelerators and innovation labs and, and so on and so forth. On the capital front, we, we definitely are looking at uh, making some uh, good strides in terms of early stage investments, uh, probably in, in Q3, Q4 this, this year. Markets, we are already working with a good number of uh, governments and countries. Canada, UK, Australia, there's Denmark, and a bunch of others, where we are kind of bridging markets by creating these soft landing programs, market access programs. Within FinTech, we have done a couple of them, which is more inbound about getting FinTechs from other parts of the world into India. At the same time, with the, the ASEAN block, we have done a program which is to open up the, the opportunities in, in FinTech in, in ASEAN as a region for, for Indian FinTechs. And lastly, services under which we own a bunch of events and conference and boot camps and accelerator programs, which we run our own brand. And that is a broader network that we bring into play. Uh, currently, I mean, we operate uh, on-ground programs in, in India and Tanzania and in East Africa. But having said that, there's a huge global network that we that we bring into play. And, and a lot of our work is, is through partner relations and partner engagements that we have in a whole bunch of countries. Uh, over the years, uh, we, we've been fortunate enough to, to work with uh, large corporates across different industries, as you can see. There's a good amount of work that uh, we have done as a team uh, in BFSI as a, as a vertical and, and setting up fintech accelerators and fintech programs. 
and most recently in the last uh, nine to twelve months, uh, these are some of the work that we have done in uh, in fintech. I mean, whether it is collaborating with Mumbai FinTech Hub in creating a India FinTech Market Access Program, whether it's working with Department of Science and Technology and and running a FinTech Accelerator, collaborating with NPCI to to enable open up uh, their APIs and get more fintechs to engage with NPCI on their platforms. Working with uh, corporates like Royal Bank of Canada and, and AGS uh, in India, running uh, fintech innovation programs, and the fintech uh, startup bridge program that I spoke about, which is more about opening up market access in ASEAN as a region. And and like Sumit mentioned earlier, and Shweta spoke about, I mean, uh, the the whole genesis of uh, fintech why was the fact that uh, successfully as a team we had created uh, fintegrate uh, ran three editions, and uh, 2020 we couldn't do one for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but the plan is to to get back to to doing a, a mega event of the scale and size of Integrate at some point in time, whether in 2021 or 2022. But having said that, now that we are all confined to uh, interacting with each other on on virtual screens, we thought that the next best alternative was to go about uh, creating a platform which kind of uh, would would replicate or would kind of uh, incorporate several elements of what Integrate uh, was built around. But at the same time, when when times are good, times are great. Uh, we'll get back to doing the the offline events, but till then, uh, fintech Y is basically to bring together different stakeholders and accelerating the the fintech ecosystem uh, in India. So our team continues to remain converge, connect, and collaborate. So collaboration is the key, and that is where we started off today in the conversation with uh, with Naveen. And con converge and connect. I mean, bringing together people through to different uh, interactive kind of forums is what we aspire to do through fintech Y. Uh, enabling those connections and bringing about collaboration in the in the broader ecosystem. Uh, I mean, as a team, I mean, uh, someone like uh, Sumit and Nitesh, both of them uh, early career, but both of them have spent good three to four years working purely in, in fintech as a domain. Between Shweta and I, we bring good experience working in the broader startup ecosystem, but also working with a lot of uh, corporates in the BFSI space and uh, churning out uh, different kinds of uh, fintech programs, not only in India, but some of the other countries as well. So we bring that uh, quality experience in not only putting this together, but kind of uh, ramping it up fast. And, and these are the components of fintech Y. So whoever is, is, is still here, uh, this is definitely a, a deck that we'll send out to all folks who registered. So we are looking at fintech Y as a, as a multi-pronged approach to bring people who are vested in the fintech ecosystem together, whether it is by way of uh, having those uh, B2B matchmaking events, whether it is curated uh, showcase or demo days, uh, global inspiration tours kind of opening up, like I said, not just India, but beyond India, uh, doing those monthly uh, fintech showcase for the fintech Y community and different knowledge sharing platforms, whether it is master classes, talks, curated content. So, what we are looking at uh, as a, as a virtual forum is about 35 plus uh, engagement touch points annually, uh, and in that way, we we hope to uh, put together strong content and around that bring very uh, good, solid people who are vested in fintech together. Uh, and there are different ways in which you can connect with. Uh, fintech why uh, as a as a stakeholder while we are definitely looking at uh, individual members to come in not in a capacity or a designation that you hold either as a founder or, or as as someone who is part of the ecosystem but also individually who wants to kind of connect and uh, contribute to, to the overall uh, fintech ecosystem there are different ways you can do that uh, access a, a large network uh, get connected to, to fintech startups uh, understand what what what's being thought about as as next in fintech, uh, networking events and meetups, B two B matchmaking sessions. So a lot of opportunities for you as an individual to plug into fintech. Why? Uh, definitely, we're looking at enterprises uh, coming in. So if you're representing a large enterprise or or a scale up, and uh, if you're looking at uh, fintech as a key or a strategic stakeholder of the work that you're doing, uh, we feel that uh, bringing you in into this uh, would make a lot of sense for for us and you and for everyone involved. For you as an enterprise, you can get access to curated uh, fintech startup, not just from India, but globally. It will help you build a presence and visibility through, through talks, networking events, and so on and so forth. Allow you to showcase some of the great work that you're doing, get access to emerging fintechs that you can partner with, and, and overall building that uh, thought leadership that, that you anyways would be doing as an enterprise. And lastly, we definitely are looking at uh, early career employees or, or people who have just graduated and are looking at making a career in, in fintech. So definitely we, we believe and we know that uh, getting access to content, getting access to people is something that will uh, definitely add value to you uh, from FinTech OI.
So uh, onwards and beyond. Uh, so we are already uh, having more than 50 odd emerging fintechs that have signed up. Another 150 odd who have shown interest in, in signing up. We're looking at building this as a community of uh, 250 plus over the next uh, six to 12 months. And we're looking at bringing in very strong accredited uh, enterprise partners to, to come in. Uh, while, we, while we continue to do uh, events which are very India centric, uh, the next thing that we're planning to do is a very uh, ASEAN focused market access program. Uh, you'll hear from us uh, soon. And the whole objective is uh, scaling the, the fintech network from, from India to, to global and creating those opportunities for Indian fintechs to, to continue shining as, as we are. Uh, Sumit, would you want to take this over, uh, introducing our partners? Surely, thanks. Uh, so I would bring on board Bebo as well. Uh, he's already uh, he is online. Uh, so Bebo, I would like to welcome you and uh, like um, if you can just uh, shed some light in terms of uh, what Switch as a platform is uh, as in parallel with Google. Good. Hi, Ajay. Hi, Sumit. Uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll quickly introduce uh, uh, what Open is and uh, what we are intending to do. Uh, so I take care of business strategy at Open. And uh, Open is an integrated business banking platform for small businesses. Uh, and if I were to explain you, you know, uh, what is it that we really do? If you look at any small business or a startup, you know, uh, the mundane aspects of running the business is something that most small businesses struggle with. Uh, the banking uh, doesn't talk to accounting and accounting doesn't talk to say, tax systems and you know other various systems that you use to, to, to run and manage your business. Uh, and uh, you know just giving out examples for uh, you know once you raise an invoice, the money hits your bank account, you often don't know where this money, came in from which customer, which particular invoice, uh, you know, when you have to make payments to your vendors or, or for salaries, uh, obviously that data sits in your accounting system and you have to make the payouts from your bank uh, account. Uh, so, so obviously those two systems don't talk to each other. We have kind of brought them together. So, uh, you know, the functions that you perform within a net banking portal, you're able to perform within our integrated platform. So you're able to see your bank statements you are able to make NFT, RTGS, IMPS transactions, and you know you're able to raise invoices and you know provide that to your customers. Uh, whenever customer pays uh, to you, you know you you know where this money came in from because for every customer that gets a virtual account which gets created. Uh, similarly, you are able to make uh, single payouts, bulk payouts, queued payouts, uh, all of that. You know. Uh, you're able to provide cards to your employees. Uh, so you, you get a debit card, also a credit card, and you know you can provide virtual cards to each of your employees. Uh, and uh, you know, as a startup or a small business, and uh, you know, when you do that, all of that uh, ties back to the expense management system, which also ties back to your uh, accounting system. So kind of makes your life easier, uh, you know, and obviously when you make payouts, uh, you have to file your TDS, uh, we make that simpler. You have to do your GST payments and reconciliations are a problem. So, so we enable all of that basically. Uh, 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 you know, and a few more features, which really help a small business. Uh, uh, you know, run these essential parts of the business in a much more easier manner. Uh, we have a million plus uh, small businesses that are using our platform. Uh, we have some twenty-four billion dollars in annualized transaction volume that we process. Uh, we were working with 18 banks uh, in various capacities. In fact, for eight banks, uh, some of the larger ones uh, like ICICIS, Axis, uh, two other very large banks, uh, you know, uh, also going live. Uh, we are powering uh, this integrated business banking uh, platform of ours for them. So we have provided our platform as a white label, and uh, you know, they are they are providing it to their customers. Uh, so over the course of building this integrated platform, we have obviously created a lot of infrastructure uh, that is useful, right? From uh, you know banking APIs uh, to payout APIs, you know different types of payouts, uh, virtual accounts for reconciliations, being able to issue and manage cards, uh, you know being able to manage the expenses, file TDS, GST. So all of this infra that we're consuming for our integrated platform, we are now exposing that uh, for other businesses uh, to consume. 
uh, and uh, we are doing this uh, through a new initiative that we have just started called Switch. Uh, and the idea is that you know, uh, if uh, uh, if you if you look at the ecosystem, you know, if you, if someone wants to integrate with any of the banks, you know, it's it's not a straightforward process. It takes a lot of time, uh, uh, and you know, the APIs are not available a lot of times. Uh, there's infosec audit. There are a lot of compliance audits that happen. Uh, so for any small uh, uh, business, it is even for large businesses, you know, it is not a straightforward uh, take. We have done that hard work, uh, and we can expose it to you know uh, businesses of all types to consume various financial services, right from you know integrating bank accounts to all of the other things that I mentioned, uh, and uh, and that is what we truly believe. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 you know. In fact, I heard on uh, one of the panels, you know, uh, mentioned, and it's a very, it's a very popular, you know, kind of saying that is that goes on in the industry that every company will be a fintech company. That is what we truly believe in. Uh, especially non fintechs uh, will end up, you know, integrating various parts, uh, you know, of, of financial services or various aspects of financial services. To either you know have better retention, engagement, monetization, or process improvement, and fintechs obviously are kind of uh, leading the way. You know, if you look at fintechs across domains, uh, you know uh, they've automated various parts of uh, the value chain. For example, if you take a lending fintech, uh, you know the most smarter ones, uh, you know, uh, are able to disburse money in an automated fashion. They're able to collect money, being able to reconcile that properly. And various other aspects, you know, that are involved in uh, uh, running the business. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, would be would would be would be really interesting. And you know, this is a great initiative uh, by Startup Rezo. Uh, there uh, doesn't really exist a community for fintech startups in India, and uh, a very welcome move because uh, you know. Uh, the more opportunities that are there to collaborate with the, each other, obviously the uh, you know uh, the the things uh, uh, that fall through the gaps, you know, uh, oftentimes you know uh, each one of us, you know, uh, uh, whenever we are running our startups, there, there, there's info that that is lacking, there's uh, knowledge gaps that exist, you know, there could be certain things which could happen in a much more swifter manner, and uh, you know we need not wait. For months, or you know, so all of those can be kind of bridged with this initiative. We are hoping to engage with uh, many startups out there, uh, share our experiences, share you know the infrastructure that we are building. Uh, you know, if we are able to uh, provide whatever access that we have uh, within the BFSI space, you know, happy to do that. Uh, so very excited to be part of this initiative. Thank you, thank you, Weber, for so much. Um, just moving on to the next slide. We also have with us uh, Sainzi, uh, one more partner. Uh, so Sumit, uh, can we invite the rep from Sainzi to come on stage? Sure. I would like to invite uh, Sheetal Jain, who is um, a member of Sainzi team. Uh, she leads the uh, global head uh, in uh, sales. Uh, she leads the India and Southeast Asia sales team. Over to you, Sita. Hi, Ajay. Hi, Ajay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sita. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sumit. And it's absolutely a pleasure and honor to be here today as a partner. And I must congratulate you and the team on the launch of this uh, event, first of all. Uh, to quickly introduce Sainzi first uh, and talk about us. We are into digital onboarding solutions. Am I audible? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are into digital onboarding solutions and uh, uh, specialized today in BFSI domain. So we are moving towards the consumer finance and distributor finance as well. When we talk about uh, digital onboarding solutions, it, is, it includes a gamut of services. It includes your modular end-to-end -end platform, along with the 150 plus microservices which come along with the platform which you may be needing for um, any of your onboarding requirements. And these, uh, when I talk about these 150 microservices, they are uh, uh, they include your uh, lending APIs, they include your KYC APIs, 
they include uh, any kind of verification APIs, et cetera, for corporates as well as individuals. And it's a completely modular model where when we say that, you know, um, you can start from um, just the UI piece, you can just start from just our room engine, you can take just the back office as well, or you could just integrate our APIs into any of your front end or your back office uh, journeys itself. So we automate your back office as well as your front end through all uh, our microservices and our platform itself. Along with that, we also launched Video KYC, a product which uh, came into being just the last year which is used currently by a large number of banks. We are working uh, in India, we are working with, apart from the top five banks, we are working with more than 100 players today, uh, which uh, come from banking, uh, financial services, as well as uh, logistics players, crypto players, gaming industry, who are using our, our services. Uh, we do plan to take up, uh, we are in the process of taking the company global and we have, we have made major footprints into, into GCC as well as US markets. We are opening uh, Southeast Asian markets uh, this year as we talk, there are discussions going on in this space as well. So that is where we are. We are a Kaladi and uh, Stellaris funded company with a, with a, a global partnership with MasterCard as well. Uh, that's on Sainzi. And to talk about um, being here, it's as I said, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, you know, I was just talking to a couple of panels and listening to where we are today. When, uh, uh, when we were studying finance, banking was all about assets and liability side. Uh, you know, it was a very physical world, of course, and uh, slowly um, payments came into being, fintechs came into being, and and so many new spaces came, uh, so many new segments mushroomed itself. Today, it's a it's a very very different world that we see, where uh, phone itself has become our identity, and um, and all this has you know fintechs have come into being and they have made it possible. Banks have tied up with the uh, with the fintechs to reach the uh, to reach where uh, where they could not reach earlier, and fintechs are here to uh, fintechs are definitely here to stay. And new spaces that we are talking about crypto or we are talking about NFT or we are talking about any other space, they are definitely here to grow and and grow much more, because our problems are not over yet. If we really want to grow these things, uh, you know, out of eight crore MSMEs, only one crore of them are actually uh, banking with some bank, and these problems can be solved only through fintechs and and the technology plays itself. So I would say that. Uh, uh, you know, the, this tremendous growth has come in. And for uh, further growth, these kind of platforms are very, very needed to collaborate further, to partner further, and to talk, to look at the new age trends. And we, and Sciency as a partner, we look forward to it. We absolutely look forward to the new partnerships and understand, you know, what is happening in this space, networking with others to, to understand what's, what's going on and what are the, where are the new uh, spaces where we can collaborate with other partners as well. And thank you so much, Ajay, for, for having this, uh, creating this ecosystem for, uh, for all the enablers and the players here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sheetal, for the, the kind words. Of course, I mean, Sainzi is uh, well known and the kind of work that you guys have been doing over the last uh, several years is fairly commendable. Uh, so look forward to staying connected with yourself, with Sainzi and our friends from Open. Uh, so yeah, so it's, I mean, we are, we are well over two hours into the program. There are only few of us left, but uh, what I would have to say is uh, join us now. Uh, we'll be definitely reaching out to people that we feel will add value to the community. So it's not just about making up the numbers, whether it is 200, 250, 500, whatever it is. It's about having quality people in the mix, people either as individuals, people as, as learners, people as uh, enterprises who want to kind of uh, come on board and, and feel that uh, they can add value to the community and the community can add value to them. So uh, memberships and registrations are, are open. Log on to fintechoi.com, go into the membership tab and fill in your details. We are live uh, pretty much with uh, all uh, social media platforms where we regularly keep 
putting out content, uh, stuff which is being discussed, stuff which we are posting, but also other things which will help further the, the fintech ecosystem or accelerating the fintech, fintech ecosystem in the country. So thank you so much. Uh, our SPOC or people leading this, uh, Sumitha Nitesh, under the guidance of uh, Shweta, you obviously know all of them. So keep uh, writing in whatever queries you have, whatever, uh, whatever uh, inputs or suggestions that you may have. And we'll be trying our best to kind of incorporate that and, and build this as a community together with uh, people from the ecosystem. Thank you so much. So with over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a wonderful evening with amazing insights from all our speakers. A big thank you to all the speakers for joining here today. And uh, thank you to all the enterprise partners, Open and SignZ for supporting the, this initiative. Uh, without you, like it, it's always great to work with you guys. Uh, further on behalf of the whole team, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us today by taking time from our from the busy uh, personal and professional schedules. Uh, well, th th that being said, a successful fintech ecosystem is where all the market participants connect, engage, and share ideas across vibrant communities and networks, and as well as identify and convert opportunities into business. And that's what exactly we are trying to build here. We are trying to build the opportunities uh, for the businesses out here, and. Uh, as Ajay mentioned, we are live with the whole uh, FinTech uh, OF platform uh, register now. And uh, that being said, wear your masks, stay safe, get your vaccines and take care.